Always make mistakes when you're in a hurry. <laughs> okay. Good morning. Go. Okay. Did you guys do your homework? <laughs> Did you guys do your homework? Chapter one in the yellow book and then take the test on page 181 in the white book. Everybody do that? Did you grade the test in the white book? Everybody do that. When I call your name, if you can tell me your score. Or if you didn't do your score, just tell me how many you missed. If you didn't get to it, just say pass, and I'll ask you again on Monday. Okay? Stacy? Stacy here? Stacy? Cassandra? What's that? 100, perfect. Natasha? Jenna? Dwight, Dalton, Regina, pass. Oh, you passed it. Okay. Yes. I'm gonna do it on the weekend. Okay, Brittany. One hundred. Thank you, Nicholas. Okay, Angela. I got two wrong, but I did go back. Okay, very <laughs> good, Felicia. Uh, okay, Marie. Pass. Okay, Catherine. Thank you, Alina. Thank you. All right, did I miss anybody? What was the question? Um, your score for chapter one, how many you missed on page 181. And you're Stacy? Yes. Is that right? Okay. All right. So over the weekend, you're going to have chapters two and three to do. So um, remember, they're longer chapters. They're going to take you a little bit more time to get through. There we go. They're going to take you a little bit more time to get through, so make sure you're budgeting your time uh, well for that because they are super long. So you'll read chapters two and three in your yellow book. You'll take the test on page 182 and 183 in the white book, and then you'll grade that. And I'll get your scores for that on Monday. not working. Okay. So today we have a lot to do in class. A lot.
but let's review what we learned in class on Monday, okay? Because we covered a lot of information on Monday. So I wanna do just a really quick review and make sure that we remember everything because we're gonna need that for what we're gonna to learn today, okay? So how do we know what to do with each patient? The care plan. We follow the care plan, the whole care plan, and so that means that we can't change it or alter it or do anything. We either follow it or we tell the nurse, right? While we're doing whatever the care plan says, what should we also be doing? Half of our job is observation. observation. And who are we going to report those observations to? The nurse. the nurse. Okay, good. So you remember skill rules. So every skill starts with an opening, but what does every opening start with? A knock. It's always about the patients. We're going to greet that patient so that they know that we're treating them as a human, not just a lump of flesh that we're doing stuff to, right? So greeting the patient is pretty important. How do we know if we have the right person? Okay, we're going to identify them by name. Very good. Very good. And that is an actual checkpoint on uh, the state exam is it says identify patient by name. And the evaluators have to follow that checklist exactly. They're not just like us with the care plan. They're not allowed to modify the checklist. So if you don't say the patient's name, you're not going to get credit for that checkpoint. Okay, so we definitely want to identify our patient by name. What do they need to know about us? Name and title. Name, and title. name is not enough. Name and title. A lot of different people working in healthcare. They need to know who you are and what role you're going to play. So title actually is pretty important. Um, what do they need to know from us? What, yeah, what we're doing. So we're going to describe the skill. You can read it right off the care plan. There's no problem with that. Or you can put it in your own words. Either way is fine as long as they have an understanding of what you're doing with them. But once they know what you're doing, what do we need to get from them? Permission, Permission consent. Absolutely. Once we've done all of that, they deserve to have a little privacy. So how are we going to do that? We're going to close the curtain, right? Because remember, exposure makes you vulnerable. Once you close that curtain, is that curtain clean? So what do you want to do after you close the curtain? Wash your hands. Got to get rid of those cooties. That is correct. Once we have clean hands, we can then go get our clean supplies. That's right. That's right. Um, remember, the most important thing here is that we don't touch the patient until our hands are clean. That is a critical checkpoint. Don't touch the patient until your hands are clean. Now, this is kind of interesting because I'm doing um, uh, research on the testing standards for every single state, all 50 states and I'm comparing all of these testing standards. Um, I'm right in the middle of working on Indiana. Now, Indiana has 72 skills. We have 20. Indiana has 72 skills, so way more skills. But their skills are things like putting the head of the bed up. <laughs> to me, that's not really a skill, but that's how they break theirs down. Okay, so they have 72 skills. But what was interesting to me is in their checklist, they want the supplies gathered before you wash your hands. So every state's a little bit different in how they're going to approach this. For our state here, we must wash our hands before we get our supplies and before we touch the patient, okay? So every state's a little bit different. So that was the opening. Now the closing, remember the order of the closing doesn't matter until we get to the end, right? There's lots and lots and lots of steps of the closing, but how does the environment need to be? Clean. 
So uncluttered, make sure you look around, okay? That's, this is my favorite saying, always leave your patient looking better than you found them. It's just a really good way to remember this. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so we wanna make sure the bed height is in the lowest position. We're gonna get into that a little bit later in the program, but what goes up must come down. The bed always has to be in the lowest position. Now, I'm talking about the entire bed, not the head of the bed. And we're going to get into that a little bit later. Um, what word do they need to hear? Comfortable. comfortable. So you got to ask, are you comfortable? Um, make sure you look at the patient, too. Um, that, that's kind of a missing step. Everybody gets so caught up in the steps that they forget to look at the patient in the bed. So take a minute just to actually look at them. Do they look comfortable? Because sometimes your patients will say yes, and they're clearly not, but they don't want to be a pain. So look at your patient. We're going to offer them some sort of reading material. So a magazine, crossword puzzle, TV remote, something to entertain them. Um, that goes along with that comfort. And we want to adjust the head of the bed for comfort. Now, they may want to go to sleep. In that case, they may want the head of the bed down. They may want to have a snack. In that case, the head of the bed needs to be up. They might want to watch TV um, or do a crossword puzzle. They may just want the head of the bed up a little bit, just a little recline to make it a little more comfortable. Whatever they want is what they get at the end of the skill. So this kind of goes with comfort, okay? Um, every situation is going to be different, but we can adjust the head of the bed if they request it. Um, remember, that goes around about comfort. Um, and then af after we've done um, those, or while we're doing those things, in the middle of all that, we want to make sure that we remove that privacy curtain because people are social creatures. So all of those steps, um, oh, I'm sorry, there's one more, one more. We have to give them a way of contacting us when we're um, leaving the room. Once all of those things are done, so comfort, curtain, call light, clean and safe, um, all of those steps, once they're all done, then we want to remove those cooties from our hands. So we're going to go wash our hands. Now, once our hands are clean, then we can document if we need to. Okay, document if we need to. But if we document, we have to wash, wash hands. hands again. So um, the reason for this is because there's a checklist line item that says end skill with clean hands. So if you've documented your hands are not considered clean, that's why you have to go back and wash your hands again. Okay, good? Let's talk hand sanitizer. This comes up quite a bit in the program. So this is my hand sanitizer, cute little guy, right? And we do use these in clinical settings. Um, in fact, most clinical settings will have hand sanitizer right on the wall. And they're good. So let me tell you the difference between hand washing and hand sanitizer. When you wash your hands, you go to the sink, you get them wet, you get some soap, you rub for how long? 20 seconds, right? All surfaces, make sure you're getting everywhere. When you rinse your hands, all of those pathogens are going right down the drain, okay? So you end up with hands that have had the pathogens effectively removed. Hand sanitizer does not work the same way. Hand sanitizer is <laughs> alcohol-based, so you get some, you rub your hands together, and that's pretty much what we do for, with hand sanitizer. Well, that didn't remove the pathogens. It killed, it actually breaks down the membranes of the pathogens that it came into contact with. But when I did that, I didn't cover all surfaces, did I? I just put a little on my hand, did this and I'm done. Well, remember when we washed our hands, we had to pay special attention to the tops of our wrists, the backs of our hands and between our fingers 
in between our thumb and index finger, the bottom of our hand by our pinky, and the palm of our hand interlacing, right? We had to do all of those things. Well, when you're working with hand sanitizer, you still have to do all of those steps. And for hand sanitizer to be effective, your hands need to be wet for at least 20 seconds. Now, we don't use hand sanitizer properly. We just use a little squirt, put them together, and that did not take the place of hand washing. So when you're using hand sanitizer, you have to make sure that you're using it properly. You've got to get more than you think you're going to need, not just a little tiny dot. You need about a quarter size amount. Whoops. So I need about that much. And when I rub them together, I'm going to rub the tops of my wrists, the backs of my hands. See how wet my hands are? Backs of my hands in between my fingers in between my thumb and index finger, the palm or the uh, bottom of my hand by my pinky and my palm for at least 20 seconds. But once I've done that, then the hand sanitizer is effective. Anything less than that, it's not. Good? You guys understand? So hand sanitizer is good, except that it does not work on two of our heavy hitters. So norovirus, also called the daycare disease or the cruise ship disease, um, is an intestinal, three-day intestinal virus. Trust me, most of you have had it. <laughs> um, it's horrible, but it spreads super fast because it's not killed by hand sanitizer. So it's really easy to spread around. The other one is C. diff. Now, C. diff is norovirus <laughs> on steroids. C. diff will give you intestinal issues for about two to three months. And C. diff in somebody that already has something going on with them can be deadly because it depletes your resources. So if we have two things that are spread super easy when you have a lot of people and they're not killed with hand sanitizer, we need to be aware of that because these things can affect your patients if they start to spread in an environment. So even though hand sanitizer is good, we have to use it properly. We also need to know that sometimes there will be signs that says hand washing is mandatory. If you see that, don't cut corners. Don't use the hand sanitizer. What they're telling you is the hand sanitizer is not effective against what this patient has. So that means that we have to go wash our hands. Does that make sense? All right. We also shouldn't use hand sanitizer when the hands are visibly soiled. So if I got stuff on my hands, whatever that stuff is, right? If I got stuff on my hands, I got to go to the sink and wash it off. Because remember, with hand sanitizer, you're rubbing all that stuff in. You're rubbing it together. But those pathogens are still on your hands. Yeah, they're dead now, but they're still there. So if I'm going to eat, I don't know about you, but I don't want that tuna salad sandwich with a side of dead E. coli. That's no better than live E. coli to me, right? doesn't go well with french fries. So if I'm going to eat, you need to go wash your hands, get the pathogens off your hands. If you're going to do anything around your face, you want to wash your hands. So smoking, talking on a phone, scratching an itch, blowing your nose, you want to make sure that you have clean hands before they go up next to your face. Good? Questions? So we want to make sure that we're not using the hand sanitizer before we eat, drink, smoke, or do anything on our face. I do have a question. Sure. So um, we are talking about patients that are not having visitations from families and friends, correct? No, no. Uh, families and friends are usually not restricted um, unless the patient is in some sort of isolation. So we do all that care, and then the family come, don't wash their hands, go there and help with this, feed, help feed, help to open a snack, 
health of Zeus and health of death, and then the what? Well, if you notice that a family is there and hasn't washed their hands before connecting with the patient, then you need to let the nurse know because the nurse's job is education. So if you come and let me know, hey, Mr. So-and-so's family is in there, but they're not washing their hands, my job as the nurse is to go in and explain why hand washing would be important. But do you think everyone that receives a visitation would wash their hands? Or I, they would wash their hands for 20 seconds? Ideally, yes. Now, it doesn't mean that we're going to be able to force anybody to do anything, okay? But here's the other side of that equation. So let me play devil's advocate with you, okay? So let's say that we have a patient who has heart failure in the hospital. Uh, their immune system's really busy trying to repair the heart so he doesn't die, right? So their immune system's super busy at the moment. And uh, a younger person, let's say he's in his mid-50s. And his family comes in to visit. Now, that family is going to be very important as part of his recovery. First of all, they need to know what's going on with him because he's going to go home at some point. They need to know what's going on. They also need to learn how to care for him, right? So that family visit is kind of important. But let's say that we're concerned about the infection. We're going to keep the family away. Well, now we have a person who is suffering a catastrophic life-changing issue, right? And they don't have the support of their family. Depression starts to come in. Patients won't eat as well. They become isolated and withdrawn. So that's not going to help their recovery at all. So we have to understand that while family and friends and visitors do bring in pathogens, they actually promote the emotional well-being of the patient, which is tied to their physical well-being. So restricting patients, visitors is not a good strategy. We actually found that with COVID because when COVID hit, we closed everything down. Nobody was allowed to have any visitors at all. And we ended up with a very high rate of failure to thrive in facilities. Patients were dying of things that had nothing to do with COVID, but it was because of the depression and isolation. They wouldn't eat. They wouldn't engage. They wouldn't, um, they just failure to thrive. So we understand that there is a huge link between visitations and mental well-being which affects physical does that make sense yeah so restricting visitors is not a good solution to this problem educating visitors is a much better solution especially if this patient is eventually going to go home right because these people are going to be caring for that patient at home so education becomes a much bigger priority. Now, I don't know who to educate if you aren't telling me what you see. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. But also, what? And? And? <laughs> um, we're leaving the patient, but we're also going to other patients. So we're protecting our other patients after we leave that patient. Right. Right? Correct. Okay. Correct. And that's a so very we're not touching. We're not right. Bugging up the whole place. Right. So our hand washing is to make sure our hands are clean for this patient, but it's also to make sure that we're not taking this patient's pathogens over to that patient. Well, the visitors aren't going patient to patient. They're just going from the outside world in. Although there's a lot of pathogens in the outside world. So we do want them to wash. Now, isolation rooms are something a little bit different. Isolation is a little bit different. If we have a patient in isolation, we may be restricting visitors. We also may need anybody that goes into the room to take some extra precautions, gown, mask, eyewear, you know, eyewear, gloves, shoe, excuse me, shoe covers, whatever the infection control nurse has deemed appropriate for this pathogen. We're going to follow that um, very, very closely, those recommendations. Okay? 
Does that help? Yes, a lot. Okay. So to understand this a little bit more, go to page 123 or 124, sorry. 124. So if we have a patient that is on isolation and we need some extra precautions, you will see a card at the door that looks similar to what you see um, in the second column there on page 124. Sorry, guys at home, I don't have this slide loaded right now. But on page, if you have your book, go to page 124 to play along. So you would see a card like this on the door or next to the door that tells you exactly what to put on for this particular patient. And it's based on how that pathogen is spread. Not all pathogens are spread the same way. We're about to learn that right now. This is a great segue into the uh, topic we're about to cover. So isolation precautions are something a little bit different. That's when we know the patient has a pathogen that's easily spreadable and we need to take some extra precautions to keep it from being spread around, okay? Now there's a specific way you have to put these items on and take them off. And this may be on the written exam. You won't have to demonstrate it on the skills exam, although I do believe that is coming in an update very soon. It will be a skill, I do believe. But you at least need to know the order to don and doff which is located on page 125 at the top of the first column, tells you the order to don and doff. Okay. Don just means put on, doff just means take off. Um, but you'll want to look at that um, lesson. You'll actually see it's in the, uh, the last column on today's syllabus. All right, so we've mastered these three principles. Out of the 11 that we have to learn, we know the skill rules. You just told them to me. We know the opening. You just told it to me, and we know the closing. So out of the 11, three are down, eight to go. And we're going to cover, I think, four of them today. Okay? It's a lot of work to do today. But I'm going to make it really easy. Just like I made it really easy to learn these, I'm going to make the rest of them really easy to learn. By the end of next week, you will know almost everything on that back wall. But I'll make it easy to learn. No stress. All right, so let's go to page 52. And we're going to learn how to do, how to take a pulse. I don't know where everybody is. All right. So if you're looking at page 52, those of you who are playing along at home, you can um, take a look at this page in your book or this is what the page looks like. You're going to have trouble reading it, though, because it's so small. So over on this side, you'll see the principles that govern this particular skill. So measure, record, radio pulse. We're going to have to follow the care plan. We're going to have to do our opening. We're going to have to evaluate for gloves. We're going to have to do the steps of pulse and the closing. Those are the principles that teach us how to do this skill. You can actually see them all written out right here. Let's talk about the specifics, though, for pulse. Again, I've got a video for this, and test-specific information is down here. So somebody with your level of experience should be able to complete this skill in five minutes or less. Um, this will be done on another student. They'll be laying in bed. We do need to chart normal 60 to 100, and we can be off by four beats in either direction. But let's get into the specifics of this particular skill. So we're going to learn, um, so let me back up. We already know skill rules. Out of everything that we have to do here, right, we already know skill rules. We already know the opening. We already know the closing. So we know these. 
but this is going to be a principle that's involved in this skill. So we've got to learn this one. We need to learn about gloves. Now, some of you are going to be challenged by this because some of you have the mindset that no matter what the skill is, no matter what the setting, no matter what the patient, the first thing you do is put on a pair of gloves. Okay. That's the mindset of a lot of people out there. Gloves. I'm going to explain to you why that's actually a very dangerous mindset for both you and the patient. Okay. So in order to um, understand this, page 40 goes over our glove rules. That's what we're about to embark on. Okay. We're going to learn all about glove rules and glove rules are a part of every single skill that we learn. But page 41 is going to give you the notes for what I'm about to tell you. So you don't have to take notes here. But this may be challenging for you, okay? In order to explain to you why wearing gloves all the time is not the right answer, I'm going to give you an illustration that has nothing to do, nothing at all to do with health care. We're going to build a sandwich. How many of you guys have ever gone to a place where they made a sandwich right in front of you and you told them what you wanted? Everybody's done this, right? Easy. So let's build a sandwich together. So the first thing we need is gloves because you don't want, I'm going to build a sandwich for you. You don't want me touching that stuff with my bare hands, do you? That's kind of gross. You will feel a whole lot better if I go grab a set of gloves. So I'm going to get some gloves and put them on. Now we're ready to start building the sandwich. So I'm going to ask you, what kind of bread do we want? White. White. So I'm going to go over here to this little um, bread holder, probably a little warmer oven thing. And I'm going to get a loaf of white sandwich bread. And I'm going to put it on the counter. And then I'm going to take a knife that's laying on the counter and I'm going to cut that bread open and fold it and lay the knife back down. Okay, good. All right. So now we need some condiments. How about some mayo? Do you want some mayo on there? So I'm going to reach into that mayo little thing that, you know, the little container of mayo and it always has that spreader knife sticking out of it. So I'm going to grab that spreader knife and I'm going to spread the mayo on the bread and stick that knife back in. How about something else? Do you want honey mustard, spicy mustard? Okay, so we'll get some honey mustard. I'll pick that up, tap it on the counter, and uh, spread that on as well. So you see the bottles there. We'll spread that on and use the knife to spread that out. So now we've got a sandwich with some mayo and some mustard. So we're off to a pretty good start here. Bacon always sounds good, doesn't it? So I'm going to get a package of bacon out. We're going to reach in and grab a couple slices of bacon. And um, then we need some meat. So what kind of meat do you want? Ham, turkey, chicken, turkey. turkey. So I'm going to open that little refrigerator underneath the counter. And I'm going to get the package of turkey out. And I'm going to lay it on the bread with the condiments, and I'm going to put the bacon on top of that. Everybody good so far? Sounds like a good sandwich. I'm getting hungry. Okay. How about some cheese? What kind of cheese would you like? American. American. So I'm going to go over here to this little cheese drawer and pull it out. Uh-oh, there's no American in here. So I'll be right back. I'm just going to run over to the cooler. I'm going to go inside the cooler and open up the containers in the cooler and grab a block of cheese and take it over to the slicer and slice a couple slices of cheese so that we can then put that on our sandwich. Now, do you want that toasted? Sure, it's got bacon on it. So we want it toasted, but the toaster is a little busy right now, so we got to wait just a second. So I'm just going to kind of stand there for a second, put my hand on the counter because it's been a long day. When the toaster is ready for us, we're going to open up the toaster oven door. We're going to take that paddle and slide our sandwich in there. 
And then we're going to turn the um, controls so that it toasts it for the right amount of time. And we'll wait until it dings. When it dings, I'm going to grab that paddle again, get the toasted sandwich out, and put it on the counter. Now we need some toppings. How about some lettuce? So I'm going to reach into that lettuce bin and pick up a handful of lettuce and spread that on our sandwich. Uh, tomato? Of course. So I'm going to reach in, grab some tomato, put that on the sandwich as well. Anything else? Olives, pickles, onions, green peppers. Okay, so I'm going to reach in each one of those and put those toppings on our sandwich. So far, it's a good sandwich. I like it. How about some oil vinegar, salt, pepper? So I'm going to pick up those bottles and spread our oil and our vinegar. I'm going to get the salt and pepper shaker and spread that on there. And then I'm going to take my hands and fold that sandwich up. Probably grab that knife that was on the counter and shove it in there as I fold it, right? Just so everything stays in there. And then I'm going to get a piece of paper and put it on the counter. And I'm going to roll that sandwich up in that paper. And I'm going to grab a bag and put that sandwich in the bag. You ready to eat that sandwich? Well, what you guys were all happy that I wore gloves. I, there's nothing wrong with it. I wore gloves when I made the sandwich. You guys wanted gloves on when I made the sandwich. So what's wrong? Okay, so when you wear gloves routinely, you stop paying attention to what you touch with those gloves. Mm -hmm. So the sandwich worker complied with the rule. The rule is you wear gloves when you touch food. They complied with the rule, but they didn't think beyond that. Now, this is just a sandwich, guys, and it was a real sandwich. I did eat the sandwich, and it was delicious because I'm the one that took these pictures so. and it was delicious and there's nothing wrong with it because I have a healthy immune system and my immune system needs a little bit of a workout now and then to stay healthy and active just like I need a little workout now and then to stay healthy right so there's nothing wrong with this sandwich because my immune system is currently functioning well now, the patients we take care of, is their immune system currently functioning well? No. So that's where this scenario changes. That's right. Because our patient, even though our sandwich worker wore gloves and touched everything, we're okay. If we wear gloves and touch everything, the patient is not going to be okay. Because their immune system can't handle another pathogen to fight off. Does that make sense? So we can't just throw a set of gloves on for everything and not pay attention to what we're touching with those gloves because that ultimately is going to put our patient in jeopardy. If you remember on day one, we talked about healthcare establishments being the one place where all pathogens go right? It is the germiest place in our community. So we don't want to accidentally cross contaminate and bring these other pathogens to our patient that we're working with right now. So we've got to use a little more discernment with this process than just wear gloves for everything. Did those gloves do what you thought they were going to do? Did they really protect your sandwich? They protected me. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> protect the sandwich worker. They're in good shape. But it didn't protect your sandwich. Make sense? So we kind of have to think or decide who do we want to protect here? Who's the one at risk? In a, in a sandwich situation, is the sandwich worker at risk? No, that mayonnaise isn't going to hurt them a bit, right? So the sandwich worker isn't wearing gloves to protect themselves. They're wearing gloves to protect your food. Did those gloves do what they were supposed to do? <laughs> no. So at this point, it's like, why are you wearing gloves? <laughs> okay. 
But when it comes to healthcare, we have to look at that, those same two questions, okay? The same two questions, as a healthcare worker, I do want to be protected from the pathogens that I encounter, but who is more at risk, me or the patient? The patient. So we need to remember that as we go through the rest of this lecture. Make sense? We need to remember who really is at risk. So in order to illustrate this, let's just take a look at some of the things that those gloves touched. Okay? So they touched the outside of the bread cart. They touched the knife, the mayonnaise spreader, the sauce bottles, the outside of the bacon package, the cheese drawer. Oops. Nope. Um, the door handle, the containers inside the cooler, the slicing machine, the table, the toaster oven, the toaster oven controls, the paddle, the lettuce, tomato, and other toppings, the wrapper, and more. So even, the, do you think the sandwich worker was aware of everything they were touching? Probably not. Probably not. Yeah, I, I, I would say probably not. Um, so do you think that might apply to healthcare? Do you think that we're aware of everything we're touching when we have gloves on? Probably not. I think we should be. Because remember, our patient is the one at risk. Make sense? All right. In order to determine if those gloves are effective, we have to understand how infections are spread in the first place. So this is going to be on page 123 of your book. Like I told you, that was a great segue into what we're talking about first. I've been doing this 15 years. I know exactly what questions you're going to ask and when you're going to ask them. <laughs> All right. So this is a very simplified version of how infections are spread, but it's called the chain of infection and it is universally recognized. But we're going to simply, this, this can get extremely complex. I mean, there's infection control uh, professionals that spend their lifetime studying this. We're going to take it down to a fifth grade level. Just a general overview, okay? So in order to understand how infections spread from one person to another, because certainly we don't want whatever the patient has, so we're a little concerned. We want to wear gloves to protect ourselves. But we have to understand how pathogens are spread in order to make those gloves effective. So the first step in our chain of infection is the pathogen. No pathogen, no problem, right? My patient has no pathogen. There's nothing for me to catch. There's no chain of infection here. This only starts if a pathogen is present, okay? But that pathogen doesn't do well out in the wide world. Pathogens just don't live very long in the open. They're not good, what do you call it, survivalists, okay? So pathogens really need a nice warm place to live. And that is generally a human. Humans have everything on board that they need. So a pathogen on a table is only going to live a very short amount of time. Very short. Now, how long that is depends on the pathogen. It also depends on the conditions, how warm, how cold, how moist, how dry. It's a lot of, you know, how light, how dark, a lot of conditions there that will affect how long that pathogen lives. But for the most part, they don't live very long on surfaces. They really need to be inside of a host. Now, most hosts are humans. We call them victims. Okay. But that home is not a prison. It's their home. It's where pathogens live. So they're not like trying to break out. They, they like it there. Everything they need. They got it all set up. Rug on the living room floor. Pictures on the wall. They like to live there. Okay, they're fine where they're at. They're not trying to escape. So you kind of have to remember that when it comes to your patients. Those pathogens are not 
knocking each other over trying to get out. They're happy where they are. In fact, the only time they're going to leave is if they're kind of forced out. Now, that force is what's important, okay? So pathogens can't escape through the skin. They just can't. Like me, trying to go through that wall to get outside. I, I'm not, it's not going to be effective. How do I get outside of this room? What do I have to use? The door. Yeah. So pathogens are the same way. Pathogens, in order to get out of their host, have to use a door. So that door is actually called a portal of exit. I call it a door. That's what that is. But just like that door will let me out, it'll also let other people in, right? So it works both ways. So that is going to be a portal of exit for people in the room and a portal of entry for people out of the room. Make sense? Good? Just like a room. Okay, so we've got a pathogen. They're living inside a host and they're super comfy. They got it all set up the way they want to. And the only way out is to use a doorway. But they're not going to go willingly. So a doorway is any wet body opening. Anything that lets stuff in the body out. So eyes. Can you cry? Nose. Your nose ever run? Mouth. Genitals. Rectal area. Wounds. Rashes. Sores and incisions. These are the doorways of your body. Good? But a doorway will let something out. But just because the door is there doesn't mean that the pathogens are rushing to get out. They actually kind of have to be forced. So if we have a patient who um, has HIV and we're going to clean their face. Now, remember, most of our doorways are right here. The majority of the doorways on our body are right here. So just wiping the eyes, the pathogens are not being forced out. Wiping the nose, the pathogens are not being forced out. Wiping the mouth, the pathogens are not being forced out. But if that patient sneezes, that pathogen is being evicted. Does that make sense? Okay. So doorways by themselves, they're a way out. We got to be careful, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the pathogens are storming the doors. Okay. Most pathogens need a little push to go out. The other part of this is that pathogens don't have feet. They don't have wings, okay? So our, pa our uh, portals are eyes, nose, mouth, genitals, <laughs> rectal area, any wet body opening, along with wounds, rashes, sores, and incisions. But pathogens don't have wings and they don't have feet. They cannot travel on their own. They just can't. They just can't. They, they, they don't have that ability. So in order for a pathogen to get out, it's got to travel in something else, a vehicle, like blood coming from a wound, um, urine coming from the body, mucus coming from the nose, okay? whatever you're coughing out, right? So pathogens don't have wings, they don't have feet, they can't break through walls. So you're starting to see that it's not as easy to spread pathogens as you would think, right? They're not out flying around. They have to travel in something else, good? Now some pathogens are super teeny tiny, itty bitty small. And they can actually hitch a ride on particles in air currents. Those are very rare. Most of those pathogens um, that can hitch a ride on air currents, they're, they're, there's only maybe four that come to mind. 
out of all the pathogens we have in the entire world, there's only like four that come to mind. So they're very, very rare. Most pathogens don't travel on air. They have to travel on, but even still the air ones, they're on particles in the air, like dust mites and, or dust uh, particles and stuff. They're still on something, right? They're not flying. There's no wings. They're not flying by themselves. They're on something. Most pathogens, much bigger, they can't ride the dust in the air. So they have to travel on mucus droplets. And those are only going to go out so far and they're heavy. So they fall. Most pathogens don't travel either one of those ways. Most pathogens stick to blood and body fluids, which means that it has to flow out of the body and it's not going to go very far. So you're seeing that there's different ways that pathogens can travel. On dust in the air, on mucus droplets that don't go very far, and on fluids that flow out of the body that go very, very close to the body. Good? So if you remember, I told you that when a patient is on isolation, we're going to put that little piece of paper by their door that tells you what to wear when you're in the room. You guys remember that? Well, the infection control specialists make a, a living off of studying the pathogens, know how they get around, and knowing which of these items would best prevent the spread of infection. That's where transmission-based precautions are. Good? So that's if we know there's a pathogen and we know how it's spread, we're going to tell you how to prevent it. Good? Okay. All right. Remember that most pathogens are going, most are going to flow from the body. Some will hitch a ride on mucus and very, very few hitch a ride on dust in the air. Now, you guys remember COVID? Okay, when COVID first came on the scene, because it first showed up, we didn't know. Is this one that travels on dust in the air? Because it was spreading awfully fast. So we thought maybe it does, you know, because it's spreading so fast. Maybe it spreads on the air. So they made the decision to shut everything down so that people weren't really close together, breathing in each other's spaces. And then they started thinking, you know, I, I don't think it's really what once we had it a little bit and we could study it a little bit more. It doesn't really seem like it's spreading on the air. It actually is acting more like it's a mucus problem, right? It's spreading on mucus droplets. And those only go out like six to eight feet before that because they're heavy and then they fall to the ground. So a good way to help minimize the amount of mucus that's coming from people when they talk and they laugh and they breathe and they cough and sneeze and all the things that we do is maybe a barrier of some kind to help prevent some of those from spreading beyond the person. It kind of like a net kind of catches it, right? It's not going to be 100% effective, but it can help minimize the amount of mucus droplets in your general area. Make sense? Okay, so sometimes with a new pathogen, it takes us a little bit of time to figure out what we're dealing with and how it spreads and to make some recommendations on the best way to protect ourselves. But at the very beginning, when we don't know, we're going to, you know, try to select an option that keeps the majority of the people safe until we can figure it out, buys us some time. Make sense? Now, COVID's been around for three years. We know all about COVID. We know how it spread. We know what it looks like. We got we got it covered. I mean, we, we actually moved at lightning speed because we were able to 
capitalize on all the knowledge that has come before because we understand this, right? Way back in the Spanish flu in 1920s, we didn't know this. So it took a whole lot longer to figure stuff out, right? We got all this knowledge behind us now, so it makes our figuring out a lot faster. Make sense? Okay. All right. So we have a pathogen that's living in a patient, whatever that patient is, and it's not going to go out through the skin. It's got to wait for a doorway to open up. And then it's going to be forced out, usually, on some sort of a liquid. And that liquid is how it's going to travel around. And that's called a mode of transmission. I kind of think of it as the car. Right? It's a way for that pathogen to get from place to place. Because remember, they don't have feet. They don't have wings. But... Remember, I told you at the very beginning that pathogens don't live outside the body very well. You guys remember that? Right? So it's got a very small window of opportunity here. In order to live, it's got to find a new host, like, really quick. Now, it has no feet. It has no wings. It can't get where it needs to go. So it's got to hope that one of you comes along and picks it up. Okay? Good? Remember, they can't fly, they can't walk. It has to wait for an opportunity, and the clock is ticking. Remember, they don't live outside the body very long. But once you come along and you touch it, well, still, nobody's going to break down the wall to get in here. What does it need? How does it get into another host? It needs a, door. it needs a doorway. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that pathogen that you picked up has to get into you. And the majority of our holes in our body are right here, right? So if you pick up that pathogen and then you wipe your nose or you rub your eyes or you eat something, you are bringing that pathogen into your body. You have brought it into an open doorway. This is why you do not want your hands around your face unless you've washed them. Make sense? Good. But even if the pathogen gets in you, don't panic because there's one more step here. You have to be susceptible. So just because a pathogen invades me doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be able to multiply and to cause an infection. It depends on how susceptible I am. So if I get invaded by chicken pox, eh, no big deal. My body's had chicken pox before. It knows all about chicken pox. It's got a recipe in a filing cabinet exactly how to kill that chicken pox. And as soon as it sees it, it goes to the filing cabinet, looks it up, pulls out the recipe card and says, okay, that's how we kill you. Here we go. And it kills the chicken pox and I don't get infected. Those of you, how many people are under 30? Under 30? Okay. Anybody under 30, you are already immunized against hepatitis B. You had to be for school. You have a hepatitis B vaccine. That means if hepatitis B invades your body, your body goes to its filing cabinet, pulls out the recipe, says, oh, this is how we kill you. Let's go. Kills the pathogen before it ever takes effect. That's all a vaccine is, is we're injecting instructions on how to kill that along with a wanted poster, right? So we give you a picture of the pathogen. We give you the recipe to kill them. We put it into your bloodstream. Your bloodstream puts it into the filing cabinet. And if you ever see that pathogen, your body will know exactly what to do with it. That's all a vaccine is. It's a wanted poster and a recipe card. <laughs> That's it, okay? So if you get exposed to hepatitis B, it's okay. Your body knows how to fight it. So you have to be susceptible. Now, there's a couple of things here that you are in control of, though. There's some habits that we have that can make us more susceptible to pathogens, even if we have a vaccine. So if we aren't getting proper rest, that can lower our immune system. And even though we may have a vaccine on board, 
it doesn't mean that we've got enough immune cells to go look it up in the filing cabinet and kill the invader. Proper nutrition, making sure that, that we're eating properly, that plays a part in our immune system. Um, exercise actually activates all of your bone marrow to produce immune cells. So exercise is good for your immune system. So our susceptibility is going to be comprised of our daily habits as well as our vaccine status and whether we've ever overcome that pathogen before. So our natural immunity. So good. So if we have a pathogen, they're living in a home. They escape out through a doorway. We come along and pick them up. They come in through one of our doorways and we are susceptible to that pathogen. Then we now become the host. That's a whole lot of steps to go through. It's not as easy it is not as easy to get an infection from a patient as you think it is. There's a lot of steps here that have to happen. Does that make sense? Okay. Now remember, having a healthy immune system allows your trained white blood cells to detect the invading pathogens and kill them. And if we can do that, no pathogen no infection. So make sure that you're keeping up with yourself. And remember that pathogens don't live very long on surfaces outside of the body. All right. So Oh, thank you, Latcha. So good morning. Thank you for what you do. Passed my state board in September. Congratulations. Great job. Okay. So when we're looking at the chain of infection, it's only when a pathogen leaves a host out of a doorway, travels either through fluid or air currents, and finds a wet body opening to invade, and that person is susceptible, does an infection occur? A lot of steps here. So I need you to understand that because a lot of times with healthcare workers, we fear the pathogens and our patients. And what I'm trying to do is show you there's nothing here to fear because we already know all about them. There's nothing that they do that we aren't aware of. So we know how to prevent this. And that's what glove rules are all about. But remember that our immune system is currently functioning well. Is our patients? No. no. So we have to think about this from their point of view as well. So if we take a pathogen that we picked up from somewhere else in the facility and we bring it to our patients and we allow that pathogen to go into one of their wet body openings, and guys, that's what we do all day long, every day as CNAs, bathing, dressing, grooming, toileting, feeding, we're around the patient's holes all day long. So if the patient is going to get an infection, do you know who the person that's going to give it to them is? Yes. Us. So as CNAs, this is critically important. I can't, guys, it would take me so much less time to just tell you, hey, wear gloves for everything, right? That's a two second lecture. I have just spent an hour explaining this. <laughs> It would be way easier on me if I didn't have to go through this. But it's not about me, is it? Who is it about? The patient. the patient. And they are worth an hour mm -hmm. of my time. They're worth your effort to understand this. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So here's our guiding principle to protect us. Don't let stuff from other people's holes into your holes. It's that simple. Don't let stuff from other people's holes into your holes. 
So if you're going to be around any of your holes, what should you do? Wash your hands. Wash your hands. Absolutely. Absolutely. This affects your personal life too, guys. Do with it what you will. Don't let stuff from other people's holes into yours. It's how you prevent infections. Okay. So all gloves do here is they provide an extra layer. That's it. That's all they do. It gives us a second set of skin. Remember, pathogens can't get through your skin. Okay. It's not even a good skin replica. It's not. Because gloves are man-made. So it just provides an extra layer for pathogens to get through. But pathogens can go through the surface of a glove where they can't go through the surface of a skin. So gloves are not the magic suit of armor you think they are. Well, let me explain this. Yeah, we already know that. Okay, we've talked about all this. Sometimes I go through it all. This is what I was telling you. Remember CNAs? We're responsible for being around the patient's holes with bathing, mouth care, denture care, peri care, catheter care, and feeding. We're the ones that are going to put our patients at risk if we don't get this right. And remember, patients have doorways out, but every one of those doorways out is also a doorway in. Okay. All right, here we go. <laughs> All right, so when our patient has a reason for us to wear gloves, if we're going to be around any wet substance, if it's ooey gooey and didn't come out of you, we probably need an extra layer, okay? So we are going to wear gloves if we could possibly come into contact with body fluids, personal skin, and non-intact skin. Remember I said doorways out include rashes, wounds, incisions, and sores, right? So those are non-intact skin. So if I'm going to be working around body fluids, I need gloves. If I'm going to be working around personal skin, this is anything normally covered by a bathing suit, so breast area on females, genitals on both sexes, I need gloves if i'm going to be working around non-intact skin i need gloves okay but if i choose to wear those gloves as an extra layer i've got to be careful what those gloves touch because remember all of those doorways out are also doorways in okay this is where it gets tricky for the patient. So our rule to remember here is the first thing your gloves should touch is the patient. So if you go into a room and you put those gloves on and you start collecting your supplies, prepping your patient, getting your toothpaste on your toothbrush, you have contaminated those gloves before you ever put them in your patient's mouth to do mouth care. And what we're doing is bringing pathogens right to the doorway of the patient. Do you guys see that? So we're gonna wear gloves if any of those three rules apply. If we're gonna touch body fluids, if we're gonna touch personal skin, if we're gonna touch non-intact skin, we need gloves as an extra layer. But we've gotta be careful to keep those gloves clean for the patient. Once we have cared for the patient, once we have touched the patient, now our gloves are soiled. So we've got to be careful about what we're touching in the environment so we're not transferring those pathogens to a surface that can then be touched by a visitor or somebody else. Okay, so we want to be aware what have our dirty gloves touched. Good? Questions? And then when it comes to gloves, knowing how to remove them is just as important as knowing when to wear them. So that's what we're going to learn now. 
So this is going to be on this is going to be on page 43. <clears throat> Oh, Jorge, yes, I was thinking about you. I know, tomorrow is going to be the day. Good vibes out to you. Make sure you let us know how you do. But we know you're going to do fantastic. Not the moon. That is not it. All right, Stacy says, hey, Miss Patty, sorry I couldn't make it in person today. See you Monday. Well, thanks for joining. Um, I appreciate that. We'll see you on Monday. All right, so I'm going to show you glove removal in a few minutes, but I gotta go. We'll do that after break because I gotta go next door and get a box of gloves. So let's go here and then we'll, we'll get back to glove removal in just a few minutes. But the first thing that you need to understand is that gloves are not the magic suit of armor you think they are. A lot of people think that once you put gloves on, you're safe, and that's actually not true. Gloves are man made materials. Now, this shirt looks like it's solid, right? You can't see through it. But if I held it up to the window, if I held it up to light, you would actually see little bits of light coming through because it's a man-made material. Man-made materials are woven together and they have holes. Now, they're microscopic. You, can, you can't see them with the naked eye. Things look solid, but there's still holes in them. Gloves are a man-made material. Gloves have holes in them. They're microscopic. Super, super, super teeny tiny. You have to look at it with an electronic microscope, but the holes are there. And holes let things in and out. Holes are doorways. Make sense? Well, let me prove it to you. Have you guys seen birthday balloons? I'm not talking about the foil ones. I'm talking about the latex ones. You know, you go buy a pack of latex balloons, have them blown up with helium. They bop up against the ceiling for a couple of days. What happens to those balloons after a couple of days? They go down. Yeah, they deflate, don't they? Yeah. So what happens there, the way that they deflate, is that when you have the balloon and you fill it up with helium, as you fill it up, the fabric stretches. And what does that do to the holes? Yeah, it makes them bigger, right? It stretches them. So over time, it takes some time, but over time, those helium molecules are able to wiggle out through those holes. That tells you right there, there's holes. You've seen this with your own eyes. Those That latex, same thing as your gloves, has holes. The more you stretch, the bigger the holes. So you want to make sure that you're wearing gloves that are the right size for you. But, you know, that helium doesn't escape right away. It takes time. So the two factors here are stretch and time. So you want to wear the gloves for the shortest amount of time possible. And you want to make sure that your gloves fit appropriately. Make sense? Okay. But remember that gloves have holes. And they've done a million studies on this. A million studies on this. They have had people that work in healthcare wash their hands really well, really well. And then they culture them. They take a swab and they touch the palm of the hand and they put it in a Petri dish and put it away. And then they have the healthcare worker put on a set of gloves and go do whatever task it is that they were going to do. And then when the healthcare worker takes the gloves off, they take another Q-tip and they culture, they take a, a sample, put it on a Petri dish and put it away. And every time, stuff grows. Pathogens get through gloves. They are not the suit of armor you think they are. Now, what makes this way worse, way worse, is that as healthcare workers, when we put on a set of gloves, our brain thinks you're safe. You're protected. 
So when we take those gloves off, we don't wash our hands because we, our brain says, hey, you wore gloves, no pathogens. Are there no pathogens? And then we take those pathogens on our unwashed hands to the next patient. Now, glove manufacturers have been trying to get us to wash our hands forever. They put stuff inside the gloves, like this powder stuff that smells awful. They did that because it smells awful. And they assume that if you got something that smells awful, you'll go wash your hands. Didn't work. You guys just learned how to do this. Right? They put uh, powder in there that was abrasive. That, that, you know, really irritated the skin. And they thought, well, that will surely get people to wash their hands. And we said, no, we, we've got this. <laughs> so the most important step of wearing gloves, guys, is not wearing gloves. It's washing your hands after you take the gloves off. That's the most important step. That's how you're going to prevent your own infection so you don't bring those pathogens up to your, the doorways in your face but it's also going to prevent you from passing that infection along to your patients who really matter here does that make sense Can i get you to think about gloves a little different okay remember that hand washing after gloves are removed, and you can wait till the end of the seal, that's fine. But hand washing after you remove gloves before you leave the patient environment is super, super important. Okay, good. Questions on that, on gloves? Okay, all right. So to review glove rules real quick, we are going to wear gloves if we're going to walk uh, to touch any body fluids, personal skin, or non-intact skin. If we decide <laughs> to wear gloves, the first thing they should touch is the patient. And then once they touch the patient, they're contaminated. So we want to be careful about all the other things we touch with those gloves. And then we have to remove the gloves correctly at the end of the skill. So for the test, we're not going to wear gloves for every skill. But you are responsible for identifying if you need to wear gloves. In fact, for the test, if you try to wear gloves for every skill, they're going to stop you. They're going to tell you, you don't need gloves for that. Now, if you don't understand infection control, now you're really in trouble because you don't understand when you're supposed to wear them and when you're not. So that's why this lecture is pretty important. Good? Mm -hmm. So the other thing that students ask all the time, well, can you give me a list of the skills that I'm going to need to wear gloves for? You know, can, can you do that? And the answer is no because it's not based on the skill. It's based on the patient you're doing the skill on. So if I'm gonna do range of motion exercises on her leg, this lady over here, um, she is continent, holding on to all of her own body fluids like a champ. She has no wounds, rashes, sores, and incisions. And I'm not gonna be anywhere near personal skin. So I do not need gloves to do exercises on her leg. Make sense? Now, same patient, same skill, but now she has an incision up her hip near where I'm going to place my hand to do the exercises. Now do I need gloves? Okay, so same patient, same skill, different scenario. Do you guys understand? Mm -hmm. If she's got a wound down her head, you're doing her leg, you don't have it. Don't need it. No, no, because remember, that's a doorway. It's a doorway out and a doorway in. But remember, I'm going to wash my hands before the scale and I'm going to wash my hands after the scale. Okay. Good questions. So be careful about wearing gloves all the time without thinking about it, because remember, 
when you're wearing gloves all the time without thinking about it, you're not thinking about it. And that's how we ruin the sandwich. Okay. I know. <laughs> Any questions on glove rolls? No, but I'll be doing the test and I'll say, oh, I'm going to ruin the sandwich. Let me put my gloves on. Yeah, that's and right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you would be surprised. Uh, most of the evaluators have watched our trainings. Yeah, you would be surprised. So remember, they have to learn how to evaluate you. So, all right, so let's go ahead and take a break. When you get back, when you get back from break, we will um, go, I'll show you how to remove your gloves properly.
okay, make sure when you're working in here that you're using the green ones. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> All right. So if we have a set of gloves and we put them on, remember that the first thing our gloves should touch is the patient, patient right? So go ahead and put your gloves on. You'll notice that when I put gloves on, I usually have my hands right here because my hands do things without my permission all the time. They will touch things without me even realizing they touch them. So when I have gloves on, I treat my hands like unruly two-year-olds. They've got to be right here where I can mm -hmm. see them at all times. And that's just a really good practice to get into. Those of you who go into any sort of sterile processing, this is a principle you will have to learn. Is that when you put gloves on, you need to have your hands in sight at all times. Because you'd be surprised at how much stuff your hands will touch. <laughs> But once we've worked on the patient, we've done our skill, we're all done, we're ready to remove our gloves, dirty glove can touch dirty glove all day long. This is fine. Dirty glove cannot touch skin. So I cannot go underneath to take this glove off. Right here at the palm of my hand, I'm going to pinch up. Remember, don't go underneath. Don't let this glove touch your skin. So pinch up and pull that off inside out and then wind it up in your gloved hand. This keeps that glove from waving around and contaminating other surfaces. You have to have control over it. Now, skin can touch skin, but not dirty glove. So this time I'm gonna go underneath. Be careful not to put your thumb on the glove. Just go underneath and pull that off as well. So one inside out glove is inside the other inside out glove. Okay? And then you throw it away. Then you wash your hands. you'll want to wash your hands. And remember, you don't have to wash your hands the second you take the gloves off. You can wait until you're done working with the patient because it's the patient's own cooties. Okay? We want to wash off the patient's cooties before we go on to the next patient. Good? Questions? So we gave her bed bath, we took the gloves off, and we can cover her up. Right. And set her up. Right. We're leaving the room. Before wash our hands. hands. Okay. Yep. So we want to wash our hands at the end of the skill. Now, if you, if your hands are soiled or something got through the gloves, then yes, stop then and wash your hands. But patient cooties are fine. That's their cooties. Or if you have the powder or something. Yeah, you can't, you can, there's no such thing as washing your hands too much for the test. You can go wash your hands anytime you want to. But remember, you can't touch the patient until you have clean hands and you have to end the scale with clean hands. So even if you wash your hands in the middle, it doesn't take the place of either of those. That would be extra. Good? Questions? Step-by-step -step instructions on page 43. All right, so to review one more time, because we're going to evaluate this for every single skill we do. Every skill. We are, we're going to use gloves when we might touch body fluids, personal skin, or non-intact skin. The first thing the gloves should touch is the patient. Once you've touched the patient, you've got to be careful about what your gloves touch after that for cross-contamination. And then we want to make sure we remove those gloves correctly. This is graded under infection control for every skill you wear gloves. All right, so let's learn about pulse, page 52. So let's figure out what a pulse is. Now on the left side of your chest, you've got a heart. Your heart squeezes. When the heart squeezes, it pushes out a wave of blood. That wave pushes the one in front of it. That wave pushes the one in front of it. That wave pushes the one in front of it. And this is how blood moves through your circulatory system. It's not a river like this. 
It is an ocean, wave valley, wave valley, wave valley. Okay, good. What we want to do when we're counting a pulse is figure out how many times the heart beat in that minute. And the way that we're going to do that is by counting the waves. So we're going to put our fingers on an artery and push down a little bit. And we're going to count the waves that we feel moving under our fingers. You're going to feel them as thumps. So each thump means the heart contracted. If we count the thumps, we know how many times the heart contracted. Now, if we push too hard, it's like a straw. We crimp it closed, you're not going to feel anything. If you don't push hard enough, you're not going to feel the waves because they don't reach the top of the artery. So you've got to start light and gradually increase your pressure until you can feel the thumps. Good? Good? Not too bad, right? Okay. We don't want to use our thumb to take a pulse because the thumb has an artery in it. And when you compress our artery, you'll feel your own thumbs. <laughs> That's not going to tell us anything about how the patient's heart is doing. It just tells us how ours is. So we don't use our thumb to take a patient's pulse. So to count the pulse, you're going to put your fingers on an artery, push down until just gradually until you feel the thumbs. And then you're going to count the thumbs that you feel to know how many times the heart beat. Normal is between 60 and 100. That's normal. What do you think we need to do with anything outside of normal? Tell the nurse. Tell the nurse. There it is. We don't solve any problems. We take the pulse and we let them know if it's under 60 or over 100. Or if it just feels funny to us. Okay. Pulses should be pretty, pretty even. Okay. If it goes... Bump, 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 bump. That's pretty even. If it goes bump, 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 that would need to be reported to the nurse because clearly that is not even. Okay. All right. So when we're taking a pulse, this is going to, we're, we're going to find the pulse at the bendy part of the wrist, okay, where the palm and the wrist meet, up at the thumb side of the wrist, but it's important to put your thumb on the back of the wrist. So if I want to take my own pulse, my, I'm going to put my fingers here and my thumb on the back. Do you see that? I'm going to tell you more about where to put your fingers in a minute. So let's talk about the thumb first. If I just put my fingers here, I will feel the pulse. But what's going to happen over the amount of time I have to count is my fingers are going to get lazy. And they'll actually relax. And I'll lose the pulse rate. If you put your finger on the back, your thumb on the back, like a C shape, this holds consistent pressure and you're less likely to lose the count, okay? So thumb on the back is actually pretty important. Always make sure that the elbow is supported on the bed. So to find a pulse, let's go through this together. If you're right-handed, use your right hand. It's more sensitive. If you're left-handed, use your left hand. It's more sensitive. So whichever hand you are, use that to take the pulse, okay? So I'm right-handed. This is my right hand. I'm going to use two fingers. I'm not going to use my thumb. Two fingers. And if you put your hand out like you're going to shake somebody's hand, see how my thumb's pointing up? Here's a bone that runs right along the top of my wrist. Find your bone. You feel that bone? Feel that bone? Okay. At the bendy part of the wrist, stand your fingers up on that bone like you're going to dive off a cliff. 
roll them forward and put your thumb on the back and you should feel your pulse because that artery that we're feeling lies right underneath that bone and we're using our fingers to push the artery up into the bone so that we can feel those thumbs. Okay. Did you find it? Did you find it? Okay. So if you put your hand out like you're going to shake hands, are you right-handed or left-handed? You're right-handed, so let's do it this way. Okay. So put your hand out like you're going to shake hands. We're going to stand on the bone, roll forward, Feel it? Did you find it? Find it? Did you find it? Yes, you're alive. Find it? <laughs> find it? Did you find it? Okay. Find somebody else's. Grab a partner. Find somebody else's. <laughs> Now, it is best to use your fingertips rather than the flat part of your finger. Can, can, can we do for the back like this or should it be like this? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. So you can use a guitar hold coming from the front or you can use a little hand. Got it? Got it? Okay. So, no, all I want you to do is find the pulse right now. That's it. Just find it. So this is what your finger should look like. Using the fingertips is way more sensitive than the flat part of your finger. So when I find a pulse, my fingers look like this. See how they kind of stand up? They don't lay down. As CNAs, we don't lay down on the job. We stand up on the job. Okay. That allows you, that puts more direct pressure and it allows you to pick up those waves way easier. All right. So how long do you count? Well, whatever the care plan tells us to do. So our care plan for this skill tells us to count for one full minute. So how long are we counting for? One full minute. Now we're going to be using Remember, we can't take our phones and we can't take smartwatches into the testing center. They're going to have a clock just like this on the wall. So we have to know how to measure a minute on that clock. And the way that we do that is we pick a starting point wherever the second hand is. And we're going to say start out loud. And then we're going to count the thumbs we feel as that second hand goes all the way back around to that starting point and then we say stop one revolution is one minute okay good everybody know how to count a minute on a clock like this analog clock all right you don't have to wait for the second hand to be on the 12 to start you can start with the second hand on the four you can start with the second hand on the seven you can start with the second hand on the ten as long as you count for one full revolution and you end where you started. So I have a way, a trick I use to remember this. Because remember, I'm counting, right? So what I do is I know sign language. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten is how you count to ten in sign language. So if I start on the four, I make this hand, remember I'm right-handed, so I'm taking the pulse with this hand. I make this hand go to work. If I start with the second hand on the four, this hand's gonna remember where I started. If I start with the second hand on the one, this hand is gonna remember where I started. If I start with the second hand on the seven, this hand is gonna remember where I started. So now I don't have to remember where I started, this hand is doing it for me. Now I'm free to count what I'm feeling. Good? Make sense? Okay. All right, so this care plan tells us to count for one full minute. How long are we counting? Okay, in a clinical setting, we're not always gonna count for one full minute. 
If you look at a minute, a minute is made up of four 15 seconds. I can divide this into four. Each one is 15 seconds. So in a clinical setting, I can count for 15 seconds, mul multiply that by four, and get the full minute reading. Perfectly okay. Absolutely legal to do. As long as your care plan doesn't tell you to count for one full minute. If the care plan tells us to count for one full minute, what do we have to do with the care plan? Yeah, we gotta follow it, absolutely. This is the number one reason that people fail this skill on the state exam. It's because they don't count for one full minute. Has nothing to do with taking the pulse. It's the fact that they didn't follow the care plan. Starting to see how important that care plan is for testing? That's really what the test is all about, following the care plan. It's a huge game, as Simon says, guys. <laughs> it really is. Just follow the care plan, you'll be fine. So that's what this is showing you. You can um, count for 15 seconds, multiply that by four to get your full minute reading as long as the care plan doesn't tell you to count for one full minute. <laughs> All right, so if you look on page 53, this is going to tell us step-by-step step how to perform this skill. So at the top, you've got our care plan, which we just saw. It's the same care plan you just saw. It says patient will be lying in bed for skill. Take the patient's radial pulse, measure out the wrist for one full minute, record your readings. Here, step-by-step step instructions. This is a sample of the documentation form you'll be using for the test. This shows you where your uh, fingers should be placed. Here's your supplies at the bottom. And here's a little quiz to make sure that you've got the information that you need to get. Okay, so this shows us exactly how to do this skill. But there's a couple of steps here that I wanna go over with you before I show you how to do this because these are our graded checkpoints. This is what they're grading us on other than following that care plan. You want to make sure you're always supporting the arm. So don't have their arm kind of hanging out there in midair. That elbow needs to be supported on a table, on a chair, on the bed. I don't care. Make sure that arm is supported. Don't use your thumb. We talked about that. We're going to use our fingertips, not the flat areas. We talked about that as well. That improves accuracy. The radial pulse is at the top side, top of the thumb side of the wrist near the bone. We've talked about where that is. And we always report the pulse over one full minute. We're going to follow the care plan to tell us how long to count for, but it's always reported over one full minute. Normal is between 60 and 100. And because we're doing this for testing, our evaluators have to start counting when we do and stop counting when we do. So for the test, you got a patient laying in bed. You're on one side of the patient taking their pulse. Who do you think's on the other side? Yeah, the evaluator. They're on the other side of the patient taking the, the same pulse that you're taking, just on the other side. Because the pulse is a measurement of how many times the heart is beating, it will be the same on both sides. But you've got to tell them when you start to count so they start at the same time you do. You've got to tell them when you stop counting so they stop at the same time you do and hopefully get the same reading. But if it's one. But you can be off by four beats in either direction. So if you get 76 and the evaluator got 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, or 80, you're still accurate. That's a huge margin of error, guys. Okay? But the thing about this skill is, even if you're off more than four, it's not an automatic failure as long as the process was right. As long as you found the pulse in the right place, you counted for one full minute according to the care plan. You did your opening and your closing and you documented the being off is not enough to fail you. We'll still count as a deficiency, but it won't fail you. <coughs> Good? Make sense? Okay. Oops. 
to go back here. All right, so. I'm going to ask you to turn your chair around so you're facing them. So just kind of turn and face them. I'm going to ask you to go over there and sit there. Do I have to take something? Nope. Just your body. Okay. I'm going to have, um, I'm going to ask you to go over there and sit in that chair. Okay. And I'm going to have you turn around to face it and you can sit there. Come on over. Okay. So I've got you guys arranged so that there's one person on a side of the table and then two on the other side. Okay. Everybody with me? Okay. My single people, one person on the side, I want you to hold both of your hands out and lay them on the table in front of you. <coughs> yep. Right. <laughs> yep. Put both of your hands out, lay them on the table. Lay them on the table. Yeah. You're going to find the pulse on that hand. You're going to find the pulse on this hand. You're going to find the pulse on the hand closest to you. So you'll find the pulse on this hand. You'll find the pulse on that hand. Find the pulse on the hand closest to you. Remember to put your thumb on the back side of the wrist. Put your thumb on the back of the wrist. There you go. Okay. When you found the pulse, when you have found the pulse, in just a minute, I'm just going to ask you to say yes, so I know you found the pulse. I'm going to do the timing for you. When I say start, I want you to start counting the thumps that you feel under your fingers in your head quietly until I say stop. And then we'll see if you get the same number that you get. Okay? Ready? Does everybody have the pulse? Ready? Set. Start. What'd you get? I got 68. Okay. 73. 73. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. So now one of the other two, right? So one of you guys is now the patient. One of you guys is now the patient. One of you guys is now the patient. Put your arms out. Okay, we're going to do it again. So find the pulse on the hand that's closest to you. Everybody got it? Got it? Yes. Yes. Yeah, your nails are probably trying to. I think it's the. Yeah, I agree with this thumb. Not that I know what mine is, but I agree. <laughs> some, some people not quite sure. You might be squishing. I think it's the position. <laughs> <laughs> right here. See Don't press hard. This is really close to Okay, ready? Set. Start.
Stop. What'd you get? 63. 64. Okay. 70. Yeah, it was right there. Okay. Very good. All right. Last person. You are now the patient. Put your hands out. Go ahead and find the pulse on the hand closest to you. When you have the pulse, say yes. You guys ready over there? Yes. Okay, here we go. Ready, set, start. Very good. What'd you get? 70, 80. Okay, very good. Yeah. Okay. But this was low or not? Okay, 60 to 100 is normal. So what would you do if you got in the 50s? 77, 77, 77. I'm going to forget. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you guys get? 70. Yeah, I didn't know if we should okay. Okay. So what would you do if you got a pulse rate in the 50s? Report it. Yeah, just report it to the nurse. We don't have to figure out, is that normal? What do we do about it? It's not our job. Our job is to take the pulse and recognize that it's abnormal and report that. Okay? Okay. Yes, you can go ahead and, and return to your seats. Now, when you guys were the patient for this, how long did that minute feel? Forever. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, you're probably like... Trying to figure out what's wrong with me or <laughs> so we need to understand that our patients are going to have that same reaction. And do you know what patients do when they get nervous? They talk. They ask questions like, is everything okay? What do you think that's gonna do to your count? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you're you'll lose track. So if you have to count for one full minute. Understand your patient is going to get very nervous thinking there's something wrong with them. So if you tell them ahead of time, hey, this is going to take me a full minute. I'll need you to remain quiet during this, but I'll let you know as soon as I'm done. That will relieve them. Okay, they know it's going to take a full minute. They're now not stressing thinking something is wrong because you're telling them ahead of time you're going to count for one full minute. And it makes the skill run way smoother. This is all about treating your patients like partners, not prisoners. Big difference there in the way we treat people. Good? Questions? Now, if you look um, on the page for Pulse, on page 53, in the middle of the page, you'll see the documentation sheet. And if you notice, there are two spots to document. So just like you took the pulse twice, right? You took a pulse twice. You took a pulse twice. For the test, you will be taking the pulse twice, once with each evaluator. Now, this is a problem, though, because I told you you have to wash your hands before you document. And now we've got to do this twice, once with each evaluator. Do you have to wash your hands before you document? 
for the first reading and then do the second reading, wash your hands and document again. Yes, you can, but they will let you cheat a little bit on the skill and they'll tell you, you can just simulate hand washing for the first one. So you would say, I'm washing my hands, documenting, and then you go back and count with the second. Good? Okay. It's a way of saving time for the test. Let me tell you a secret about those evaluators. All of your evaluators are RNs. They all have extensive experience in not only nursing, but also either a supervisory role in long-term care or as an educator. These are not brand new RNs. These are people that know their stuff inside and out. Most of them are nearing retirement age and they're doing this because they don't want to be in a clinical setting anymore. Okay. Where they really want to be is at home in their pool, drinking their Mai Tais. You know who's standing in their way? You. So the longer you take to do these skills, the longer you're keeping them from floating in their pool. So we want to make sure that we're getting them to their pool as quick as possible. So if they tell you you can simulate, they mean simulate. They want to get home. They don't want you to go above and beyond. Okay, good. If you understand their mindset, it makes this go a whole lot better. It does. They don't want to be there. They want to be at home, just like you do. This is their job. So help them do it easily. You'll win friends. Okay. So good? Questions on Pulse? Pretty easy, right? Pretty easy. You will have some opportunity to practice this. The first uh, two weeks, I don't give you any practice time in class. We don't have enough under our belt yet to practice. Okay, so the first two weeks, I'm just going to go from skill to skill to skill to skill, and we're learning principles along the way. After week two, you're going to have some practice time built into each class session. So on week three, you'll have about a half hour on Monday, about 45 minutes on Wednesday. Week four, you'll have about an hour on Monday and about two hours on Wednesday. Uh, you also have this room available to you for practice up until four o'clock until you graduate. So when you're in here learning next week and you're like, hey, I really have to practice some of these, you can make a friend and stay after until four o'clock to practice. We don't have practice time built into the program because I've got so much to tell you but you are able to practice on your own time. The practice room is available. Sound fair? Week three, you're gonna get some practice in class. Week four, you get even more. Now, after graduation, when you're all done in here, you can still come back in this room and practice on Mondays and Wednesdays from 1.30 until 4. Right now, it's, you know, from 9 a.m. till 4. Whenever you want to practice, it's fine. But once you graduate, I won't let you back in until 1.30. And that's because I'll have a new class of students in here. And if you're banging down the door at 1 o'clock to get in, they're going to feel like they're being rushed. Okay? And you guys are already uncomfortable on week one anyway. You don't know what to expect. You're the freshmen, the new kids. It's a little unnerving. So I give you that half hour buffer from class ending until practice people can come in. Does that sound fair? Yes. So for a month after you graduate, you can come back in and practice. Okay. If you need a little bit of additional time, there's a delay in your test, whatever, I take that on a case-by-case -case basis. I can't extend it out a couple of weeks if I need to for you to be able to come in and practice before you test. I want you to be successful. But if you come to me nine months from now and say, yeah, I didn't get a chance to test and I want to come in and practice, I'm going to tell you no. I'm not doing it to be mean, but I'm protecting my current students. 
Because imagine you stay after today and you're practicing and some stranger walks in that you don't know and says, yeah, I took the class two years ago, but I never got a chance to test. And now I'm here to practice for the test. I don't remember anything. So teach me. That's not fair to you. You're brand new. That is not fair. So to protect my current students, I'm not going to let you back into practice after significant time has elapsed. Does that sound fair? Mm -hmm. So my advice to you is take the test. Don't put it off. You will be ready, way readier than you think you are. You've got to have faith in me for that. So when is the next test? Do you know? They test seven days a week. So we can take it immediately after graduation. We're going to be going through the test registrations next week, next Wednesday. I give you the registration forms. We go through it in detail. You will register when you are able to do so. I recommend that you register when I give you the paperwork. If you register when I give you the paperwork, you should be testing about a week or two after graduation. So the background <laughs> check you must have had? You have to have a background check. This is, yeah, you have, this question keeps coming up. You have to have a background check before you register for the test. But we're going to go through all of that in detail on test registration day. Okay. I don't want to get too far off topic because then we won't get to everything today. Okay, good. I have a very defined way of teaching this class that I've developed over 15 years. And I do things at specific time for a reason to make sure that, that we stay on track and that you get the right information at the right time. Okay. If we registered this week, some of you would get your test date before you graduate. And that's not, that's not good for your mental health. Okay. <laughs> so that's why I do it the, at the time that I do. You need about a week after graduation, a week to two to be able to practice the skills that we learned. That way you're in good shape for testing. So any questions on Pulse? And I apologize, guys. Um, I told you to bring your blood pressure cups and stethoscopes today. You don't need it today. You need it on Monday. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. So we're going to do blood pressure on Monday, not today. I was ahead of myself. <laughs> All right. So let's move on to another skill. Mouth care. This is going to be, yeah, going to be on page 92 of your skills book. I'm at page 92. Now, if you look along the side here, there's a lot of principles that we're going to be using. We already know to follow the care plan. We know to do the opening. Every skill starts the same way, right? Every skill starts with the opening. Every opening starts with a closing. Knock. 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 Yep. <laughs> We're going to get to closing in a minute. Yep. We know that we have to evaluate whether we need gloves for this skill, which we'll do. But we haven't talked about barrier rules, and yet that's part of this skill. We haven't talked about linen rules, and that's part of this skill. We haven't talked about base and cleaning, and that is part of this skill. So we got some learning to do before we can learn how to do mouth care. Okay. Mm -hmm. All of the specifics for these three principles that we're about to learn are detailed right here. We're going to go through them in detail. And I do have a video for that. There's your cliff notes and that's testing information. But let's get into the first principle that we have to learn and that's barrier rules. So these are the three we're going to be learning right now to do this skill, but we're going to start out with barrier rules. This is going to be detailed on page 84 and 85 of your book if you want, you know, to refer to it for notes. I do have a video on it that you can watch, a little animated video on the barrier. And we're going to use a barrier in most of the skills that we do. If you look here, you can see that out of the 20 skills that we're going to learn, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, six of them, just six doesn't use the very barrier. So out of 20, there's only six that doesn't use it. So it's going to be used a lot. Uh, up until now, 
Skill rules, opening, glove rules, and closing, those are in every single skill. Every single skill. Barrier rules, most skills. Good? Questions? Let's get into it. All right, your notes are on page 85. Well, let's talk about overbed tables. These guys right here. This is, in a clinical setting, what you're going to use to put your supplies on. The problem is that an overbed table is not just used for your supplies. They're used for meals. They're used for the patient to store frequently used items on. They're used for all kinds of things. And that makes this table unclean. We can't consider this table clean. It probably has brown gravy on it from last night's dinner and grape jelly from this morning's breakfast. It's probably got some cooties from the cell phone and the chapstick and the crossword puzzle book that's been laying on it. They're not clean. But I need a clean surface to put my clean supplies. So that becomes a problem. Remember that when I go get supplies, the supplies are clean. Putting clean supplies on a dirty table, that's not going to work. So we need a clean place to put our clean supplies, and we now know this table is not considered clean. Now, I could go get a wipe and wipe it down and take everything off of it and all of that, but we really don't need to do that. What we're going to do instead is use a barrier. So a barrier is anything, anything clean. You can use a bath towel as a barrier. You could use a hand towel as a barrier. You could use a paper towel as a barrier. But for the test, we're gonna use something very specific as a barrier. Okay my visual demonstrations here. All right, for the test, we are going to use this. This, the technical name, is a disposable underpad. That's a whole lot of syllables, disposable underpad. And we don't call them that because that's a lot of syllables. So we usually call this a chucks because it's the kind of underpad that you chuck when you're done with it, disposable. So a disposable underpad is called a chucks. Now this is a little bit different than this. Some of you are familiar with these. These are bed pads. These are washable underpads. So technical name, like I am Patricia, right? Technical name, washable underpad, disposable underpad. But I have a nickname, Miss Patty. That's what everybody calls me. Chuck's Bed Pad. That's the nicknames. Good? These are not usually used as barriers because they're big and they're bulky and they're heavy and they're just better to use on the bed. So we don't usually use these, but you can as long as there's, they're clean. Anything can be used as a barrier. For the test, we're going to use a disposable one. Now, disposable underpads have an absorbent side and they have a waterproof side. They come in different colors. Some of you are familiar with puppy pads and they can come in a light green or a light blue or a tan or all kinds of colors. doesn't really matter. Um, but you need to know they have a um, waterproof side and a, dis a uh, absorbent side because that's going to affect how we put them on the table. When we use this as a barrier for our supplies, we always use it with the absorbent side facing up. That way, if any water should spill, it will be absorbed. It won't roll off the waterproof so side onto the floor. Questions? These are also these are also called chucks. So remember that the supplies that we use are clean, and our hands are clean. 
So we need a clean place to put those supplies. What is not clean is your uniform. So your uniform, when you start working, is going to brush up against that privacy curtain. Is that clean? No. It's going to lean up against the sink. Is that clean? No. It's going to kneel on the floor. Is that clean? No. It's going to press up against the bed, the patient sheets. Are those clean? No. So once you start work, your uniform is not clean. So you don't want to hold any clean items against your uniform. Got it? That is a testing principle. It is actually a checklist item. Refrain from holding items against the uniform. You have to understand that your uniform is not considered clean. Yeah, this just goes on to explain. You have touched all kinds of surfaces with that uniform. So remember that clean supplies should not touch your uniform. So the reason that this becomes important, so I've done my opening. Hi, Ms. Jones. Good morning. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. I'm here to brush your teeth. Is that okay? Patient says yes. Awesome. I'm going to close the privacy curtain and go wash my hands. Now, I got a lot of supplies I've got to get for this skill. We're brushing teeth. Right? So I've got to get a basin for them to spit in. I have to get a cup of water for them to rinse with. I have to have a toothpaste. I have to have toothbrush. I have to have a towel to put over their chest. And because I'm working with body fluids, I'm going to need a set of gloves. So it's a whole lot of stuff. So if I gather all of that stuff up and I've got all of that stuff in my hands, I have no hands left to spread out the barrier on the table. So what am I going to do? Just like this. Hold all of those stuff, those things against my uniform and try to spread that thing out with one hand. Well, what I've done is contaminated all of those items. So when we're working with barriers, the first thing we do when we wash our hands is go get that barrier. This shows that. Go get that barrier and put it on the table first. It's the first thing we do. Then, once the barrier is in place, you go back and get the rest of the supplies that you need. Okay? And a lot of CNAs get this all mixed up because they want to just do one trick. They want to get everything at one time. But if you do that, you're going to contaminate your items. So we need to understand that we do our opening, wash our hands, get our barrier, put it on the table, and then get our supplies. Good. Now, even though I've told you that, some of you guys will still go get the barrier with your supplies. And experience is the best teacher here. Because you'll get over here and you'll be like, I don't know what to do now. So you experience is the best teacher. When you're practicing in here and you're making mistakes, you're learning. And I bring that up because in a week and a half, you're going to have some practice time. And when you're in here practicing, you're going to want it to look as smooth as I make it look. You don't have the level of experience I do. I've been doing this for over 30 years. I can do this in my sleep. No worries. You're brand new at this. So it's going to feel very choppy for you. And that's okay. The test is not testing you on how pretty you make it look. What they're testing you on is do you know that when you hold the, the things against your uniform, you're contaminating them. Do you have that level of understanding? Not how pretty is it, okay? Does that make sense? Let's so not try to make it, make, make it pretty. I have a question. 
say you come in, you introduce yourself, you close the curtains, you wash your hands, and you go get your your cover for your table. But say there's something on the table prior. At what point do you remove the stuff before you wash your hands after? Okay, so I'm going to answer that in two different ways. Okay. okay, the first is for the test, the table will always be empty. Okay. <laughs> easy, right? The test makes it easy for you. But in a clinical setting, you're not always going to be able to remove the items from the table. You're, you're not always going to be able to give yourself a full surface to work on. In that case, I would just kind of move some stuff and put the, the barrier on the part of the table I'm going to use. Or if there's like a space on the bed, are we able to do the same thing? I prefer not to use the bed because in bed, patients scratch what it is and there's, it's just not a clean, even with a barrier. I don't use the bed. There's nothing in the, the checklist that says you can't, but it would be best to not. Okay. Um, but to answer your question, it's a complicated answer because it depends. Okay. Those items we know aren't clean. Whatever's on that table, I know isn't clean, but I don't want to touch it until my hands are because I don't want to make it any dirtier. This is stuff the patient uses. So I would do my opening, I would wash my hands, I would remove everything off of the table that needed to be moved for me to be able to utilize that space. Now, this is where it gets tricky. If I'm going to use gloves, I already have an extra layer, I probably wouldn't have to wash my hands again, I would just do the skill. Unless it's something invasive. If I'm doing peri care, even with gloves on, I know that the gloves have holes, so I don't want things to get in and out. So I would probably wash my hands again before I put gloves on, okay? If I'm just doing range of motion exercises, no big deal, right? If I'm doing mouth care, I'm putting my hands in somebody's mouth. That's a doorway. I probably want to wash my hands first. So it depends on the skill that I'm doing, whether I'm wearing gloves and the portals of entry that I'm going to be. Does that make sense? You can simplify it by saying, if you touch anything after your opening, go wash your hands. I mean, that would be the simple way of doing it. You got to look at each, everybody's different. When you walk right. in the room, see what you got, right? Right. Everything is going to be different. Unfortunately, people aren't and this is why I can't ever give a one size fits all answer, because if I walk into this room, both of these people, even though they're here for the same thing, they look alike, you know, the same conditions, everything. They're both complete different individuals. This guy has got a table full of all kinds of stuff. That one, the table's empty, you know, everybody's going to be different. So it depends on the scenario that we're in. Okay. So I have another question. So we are taking this test, and let's suppose I grab some stuff, my hands are clean, and I come, and I drop something. What should I do? Leave it there and go back and get another one and pick it up only on the end? Or can I just pretend that that never happened, grab it? And <laughs> if it falls on the floor, we can't use it. So we can't pretend. No, during the test. Right, that's what I'm saying. If it falls on the floor in the test, we can't use it. We can't pretend. So, so okay. it, it, it is now dead to us, <laughs> okay? If it falls on the floor, we can't say correction. It, it, it doesn't, we can't use it. So your answer now, your question now is about infection <coughs> control, okay? We know we have to get another one. That, that's the point I'm getting to. You can't use that one. You can't make it magically clean with words. So we can't use it. So we know we got to get another one, okay? So our question is now infection control. And again, this is going to depend on the scenario. If it's not in my way, I'm going to leave it until the end of the skill and then pick it up at the end during my closing when I want to make sure I have a clean environment. If it's in my way, if I'm going to walk this patient and I got this is in my way, then I would pick it up and dispose of it, wash my hands, and then resume. And for the test? Again, it, 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 it depends on if it's going to be in your way. 
if it's in your way, pick it up, dispose of it, wash your hands. If it can wait until the end of the skill, you can leave it there. There's no, no problem with leaving it there until the end of the skill, as long as it's not in your way. Okay. You look confused by that. No, no, I just thought, thought I could say, okay, I know I have to get another one, but as we are testing, maybe I get this on or something. So I cannot do that. I no. I have to ignore it and get another one, or if it's in my way, do it the proper way, like if I was. Dispose of it, wash your hands, and then resume. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. But no, once it's on the floor, you cannot use it. And here's why, okay? Here's why. So we're doing mouth care. That, that's the skill that we're doing, right? So let's say that you accidentally drop this on the floor on your way. And for the test. So I'm talking about the test, right? Yes. So if you just say out loud, I, I wouldn't have dropped it. Correction, I wouldn't have dropped it. And you pick it up and you use it. You're actually really brushing her teeth for real. For real. You are going to have a toothbrush. She is going to open wide and you are going to brush her teeth. Oh, Do you think that she wants something that's been on the floor on that table where her toothbrush is going to be? So it's actually going to brush her real person? For real. Oh, I thought that I it was a manicure. Real no, manicure. we're going to get there. I know. I, I, I need to lead you there. Oh. But since you brought up the question, I'm going to answer it. Oh. You are really going to do all of these skills on a real person, another testing student, except for four skills that we're going to do on the mannequin. Dressing, carry care, catheter care, and drainage bag. Those are the only ones that we do on a mannequin. Everything else is done on a real person. So if you're taking pulse, you're doing it on a real, person. a real person. When you're counting respirations, you're doing it on a real person. A real person. When you're feeding somebody, you're feeding a real person. Yeah, and when you're brushing teeth, you're doing that on a real person. So that's why for the test, you can't drop this on the floor and say, correction, I wouldn't have dropped it. It's clean. Pick it up and use it because you're using it on a real person <clears throat> okay does that answer your question yeah okay all right so here are our steps for barrier we're going to get the barrier first we're going to put it on the table then we're going to go get the rest of our supplies and put them on the barrier good okay so to recap a barrier provides a clean area for our clean supplies. We only touch supplies with clean hands. We don't let the supplies touch our uniform or clothes. And we get the barrier yeah, first before getting our supplies. That is correct. So just four simple steps here. But do you understand why? Do you understand the why behind it? I have a question. Sure. So when getting our supplies for brushing our patient's teeth, how many, like the wash gloves and the towels, how many of that would we have to get? Unfortunately, you have to memorize that. Okay. And the reason is that if I'm the nurse and I ask you, what's your name? Catherine. Catherine. If I ask you, Catherine, can you go brush the brush patient 212's teeth for me? And you say, sure. I'm not going to tell you, okay, and to do that, you're going to need a towel, uh, you know, basin, toothbrush, toothpaste, gloves, you know, cup of water, uh, basin. This, I'm not going to tell you all that. I assume that when I ask you to brush your teeth that you know what supplies are required. Does oh, that so make sense? Set for the test. So, yeah, you've got to learn your supplies. But, yes, there is a set oh, amount. Okay. So, in your book, if you go to page 93... And you look at the bottom of the page 
on page 93, if you look at the bottom of the page, you will see the supplies that are required for this skill. Now this looks like a big list, I know. How many of you guys have brushed your teeth this month? <laughs> so you're somewhat familiar with the skill, right? It shouldn't be like totally new to you. Okay, so what do you need to brush your teeth at home? What do you use? Toothbrush. Yeah, it's not a hard skill, right? Three-year-olds brush their teeth, not very well, but they still do it, right? <laughs> So, so we know it's not a hard skill, but it, and we just think, well, you need toothbrush and toothpaste. Well, where are you spitting? Right. Well, they're not at the sink, so what do we need to give them? Yeah, something to spit in. And what? How do you rinse? Yeah. So they need a cup of water, right? So we know we need toothbrush and toothpaste. We also need a cup of water to sink, which is no different than what we use, that we just have to bring a portable one to them, right? When we're brushing our teeth, we're standing over the sink, which means that all that foam and stuff is falling down on getting on our clothes. Where's our patient? In bed. In bed. So they're sitting up like this. So all that foam and stuff is going to go yeah, on their clothes. So let's give them something to cover that up with. So we're going to add in a towel. And because we now know glove rules and we're touching body fluids, what else do we need? Yes, yeah, set of gloves. So make the supplies make sense to you. Does that make sense? Make it make sense. Make it logical. So what is the process when brushing a patient's teeth? Because then most of us we probably wet our toothbrush. Yeah, I'm going to show you. I'm going to go through that in detail here. Like everything else, I have a detailed explanation <laughs> for it. <laughs> I don't leave anything to chance in this class. <laughs> All right, but one of the things I want to show you, what, now that we're on supplies, since you brought it up, I'm a horrible salesman. I, I don't tell everybody about all the stuff that I have for you, but this gives me an opportunity to do that. So in, these are the flashcards. I sell these. Right now, while you're enrolled, you can get them for $14.99 or $15, whatever's on the paper I gave you the first day. After graduation, they go up to $19.99. On my website, they're $24.99. Okay, they're, they're color flashcards. But I have flashcards on all of the supplies. So you'll see the name of the skill, and then on the back of it are the supplies that you need. I also have the steps for each skill and the principles involved. And then on the back, I have all the principles in a review format. So this covers everything that we're learning. The supplies, the steps, and the principles that tell us how to do those steps. <clears throat> you can make your own. You have all the information in your book. You can make your own. Um, and you'll probably learn if you make your own on flashcards. These are just for, you know, those that want a handy, easy to transport format. Okay. So you can get those next door. But it goes over all of the supplies. So, yes, you do have to learn the supplies. But they're in your book. And we also have the flashcards. Okay, good. Like I said, I'm a horrible salesman. I never tell everybody everything I have for them. And then people get mad because I didn't know you had that. But I don't like to, I don't like to sell stuff. So I, I'm a creator. I like to create. So after the CPR, we can go there and give it for people. No, unfortunately, it's only scrubs that 50% off. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. So we've learned barrier now. We now have that principle covered. So let's move on to linen rules. So this is the next principle that we're going to learn. And you can see this on page 86. Now, again, this is going to apply to a lot of our skills. So if you look on page 86, you can see all the skills that this principle is going to apply to. And it's 
uh, a little more than half of our skills. So this is going to be important. We're going to use this a lot. Basically, any skill that has linens, this applies to. So for mouth care, we have a towel. That's a linen. So these rules are going to apply. Good? Now, some of these you've already seen, like the first one. Oh, here's your notes. Hey, Jay, you send us your notes. So the first one we already know. Linens must not touch uniform. So here's the thing, guys. If a, a principal shows up on more than one principal, you know, if, if a, um, a checkpoint shows up on more than one principal, that means it's really important. Pay attention to it. Well, we learned this with barrier, right? When it's much, must not touch uniform. It's on our barrier rules. But it's also on our linen rules, which means it's twice as important. Does that make sense? Second one you know as well. You must have clean hands to get your linens. Yep, we've heard that before too. So that means it's doubly important. So these are things that are on the checklist that are weighted heavily. Alone, they won't fail you, but they're weighted heavily, which means if you put a couple of these together, they could tip the scale and cause you to fail. Make sense? Everybody understand that weighted grading that we were talking about? Okay. So now we're going to get into a couple of new items here. So principles that are repeated are doubly important. Okay, so our new item here is that we don't want to shake or snap <laughs> linens. So when I'm spreading something out, whether it's a towel or a washcloth or a blanket or a sheet or anything like that, at home, when you're making a bed and you have a sheet, you probably do something like this. Right? To get that sheet spread out. The problem is when you do that, when you do this, and what I used to do is put powder on this bed and do that, but I have um, I have allergies. So when I do that and that I inhale that powder, it makes me cough for like five minutes straight. So I quit doing it. Um, not good for my lungs. <laughs> when you do this, everything on that bed gets sucked up into the air. It creates a vortex. Now, what's on that bed? Pathogens, yes. But not just pathogens, dead skin cells and yeast particles that have fallen off of the patient. So you've all heard that mattresses get heavy over time, right? Because they absorb all that stuff. That's the stuff that's laying on the surface of this bed. When you snap that sheet, it pulls all of that right here that you can breathe in. <laughs> So we don't want to do that, especially with patient pathogens. Remember, these pathogens are bad enough to make our patient not be home. We don't want to be breathing these in. So we don't snap or shake anything in healthcare. We simply unfold and spread. Okay, if you snap and shake your sheet at home, you're only breathing in your own funk. Don't breathe in anybody else's. Own. Remember, doorways. Okay, doorways that allows pathogens to enter your body. Good. So here's another new one. Unused items must be discarded. So our the way we remember this is we use it or we lose it. It's that simple. We use it or we lose it. Okay. So if I take, if I need a towel to do mouth care and I take two, by accident. I can't leave that second one in the room for later. Because if it's out of my sight, I don't know who's touched it or what's happened to it. It's not clean. I also can't put it back on the supply shelf because that's like an ATM. You can take money out, but you can't put it back. <laughs> okay. Everything in there is clean. Once I take it out, it's 
not considered clean. I can't put it back. So if we take too many of something, we either use it or we discard it in dirty linen. That is a nursing principle. Good? Good? All right. The other two here that are blanked out that you can't see right now, we're going to get to in a future lesson because it doesn't really apply to today's lesson. Okay. Yeah, items out of your site can't be considered clean. We'll cover the rest of linen rules in detail in a future lesson. So our linen rules are that we've learned today, linens must not touch uniform. We have to have clean hands to get our linens. We're not going to snap, uh, shake or snap those. And anything we don't use, we're going to discard. So everybody go with those linen rules. They're going to apply to every skill we do with linens. The last principle we have to learn to learn mouth care is basin cleaning. Now, this is probably the hardest one for students to learn in reality. I'm going to surface level overview it for you. You're going to see it in this skill. We're going to talk about it in some future skills. If you don't get it the first time today, that's okay. We're going to see this over and over and over and over again because it does show up in quite a few skills. Okay. Anything that holds a liquid is going to be cleaned the same way. Doesn't matter what the liquid is. If it holds a liquid, we're going to clean it the same way. And the process is actually pretty easy. Not when you're learning it, but once you learn it, it's pretty easy. The one thing I need to get into you, though, is that this is not sterile. We're not trying for sterile. We are trying for clean. Okay? So if you're trying for sterile, this isn't going to make any sense at all. We're trying to reduce pathogens, not eliminate them. Everybody got the right mindset here? Okay. So at home, when you brush your teeth, you do that over a sink. When you brush your teeth, you probably drop globs of toothpaste in the sink. So before you finish brushing your teeth, you probably take some water and just rinse out the globs of toothpaste in the sink. And then you go along your merry way, right? Sound fair? You're not pulling out the bleach and a scrub brush and brushing that thing down every time you use it. We just rinse it off. Good? That's all we're going to do in patient care as well. We're going to rinse it off. Remove the big globs. Okay? Good? We're not trying for sterile. But... This is where it gets tricky. Okay. So for the test, we're just rinsing it off. But there are some patients that need a little bit extra TLC with their items. So these are particularly patients that um, maybe have an immune system that is particularly compromised. So patients undergoing chemotherapy, patients that have HIV, those that, that are fighting off multiple illnesses at one time, people that are more at risk, there may be an extra step added in called disinfection. So what I'm going to show you, cleaning the basin, allows for that step if it's needed. So one process, but it allows us to spray it with a disinfectant using <laughs> this same process. Good? Mm -hmm. Questions? So 99.9% .9 of the time, we're just going to rinse it, get the big globs out like we do at home. But if the patient needs additional infection control measures, 
This process I'm going to show you allows for that step to be inserted as well. How would we know when we need to disinfect? Look at the care plan. Care plan. Absolutely. Care plan. Remember, our care plan is individualized for that patient. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So our details are on page 91. But when it comes to basin cleaning, the first thing that we've got to do is empty out the liquid in the basin. That just makes sense. You can't clean it if it's full of liquid. So we got to empty out the liquid. And people get all, like, caught up in this. This is super easy, guys. Where does it normally go? <laughs> it depends. It depends on the liquid. When you're brushing your teeth, do you do that over the toilet? That would be weird, <laughs> right? Where do you brush your teeth at? So if it's saliva, where would it go? Sink. Sure, absolutely. Um, if we're dealing with urine, where do you normally put urine? In the toilet. Yeah, it'd be a little weird to pee in the sink, right? Pretty gross too, I think, but a little weird, right? So if it normally goes in the toilet, that's where we're going to put it. Now, bathing is where people get really, really upset about this. <coughs> Guys, it's just water. It's water. Where does water go? Down the drain. Yeah, in the sink. You don't have to put water in the toilet. The toilet already has water. It doesn't need any more. So our question here is, where would it normally go? Okay, good. When you're bathing a baby, do you do it in a sink or a toilet? Sink. <laughs> bathing water goes in the sink. Good? Mm -hmm. Questions? So we're going to dump the basin where it normally goes. People will create all kinds of really, like, complex rules for this. If it's below the waist, it goes in the toilet. If it's above the waist, it goes... The... No. Where does it normally go? Right. <laughs> Just easy. Make it easy. I'm not about complicating things, okay? So all we're going to do here is rinse the basin. Get out the big globs, right? Rinse the basin. And that's all I'm doing here is rinsing the basin. Um, but once we've rinsed that basin, we can't put it away wet. If you remember, we talked on Monday about three things in an environment that pathogens need. Warm, dark, and wet. moist. Yeah, wet. So we can't put these basins away if they're wet. That means we have to dry them off. Good? Make sense? Okay. Because the drawer is already warm and dark. We don't want moisture there. So we're going to have to dry this off. I also told you that this process is going to allow for disinfection if we if the care plan calls for it. So this is where it gets a little tiny bit complex. Okay. So we're going to rinse this basin out. No problem there. And then we're going to set it down in the sink. Now this basin is only used by this one patient. We don't spread it around from person to person. This guy has his basin. That guy has his own. We don't share. So that's why we can just rinse it out. It's like your sink at home. Okay. We're just going to rinse it out because it's only used by that one person. But if that person needs for it to be disinfected, what we're going to do is rinse it and set it down in the sink. And the reason we have to set it down is because I can't disinfect this basin if my dirty glove is holding it. This would cross contaminate. I can't be holding the basin while I'm disinfecting it. Make sense? So I'm gonna rinse it, dump it out and set it down. When I set it down, then I can spray it with my disinfectant. Outsides of anything are never considered disinfected, by the way. <coughs> the so 
I've rinsed it. I dumped it. I rinsed it. I set it down, sprayed it if I needed to. Now my basin is clean, but my gloves are not. So I can't pick that basin up with those gloves. What I need is a barrier in between my glove and the basin. You guys understand why? Once the basin is clean, we have to have a paper towel to pick it up. Now we're going to dry it because we can't put it away wet. So I'm going to get a paper towel to dry the inside. And we're going to use a different paper towel to dry the outside. Because remember I said that the outside is never considered disinfected. Different paper towel. The whole time I'm holding it with a paper towel because I don't want my dirty gloves to touch it. Now I've got to put it back in that drawer. My gloves are dirty. This drawer doesn't need to be contaminated further. So I'm going to use a paper towel to collect the supplies and open and close the drawer. Good. I know that was a question that was asked on Monday. Okay. So once my gloves are contaminated and I've rinsed out my basin, my contaminated gloves should never touch the basin, the supplies, or the drawer. I have to use a barrier. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So this is probably the hardest principle that you guys have to learn. You'll see it today. You're going to see it again and again and again and again. And by the end of the program, you'll get it. You'll, you'll be able to put the pieces together. But the steps are detailed right here. We're going to empty the basin in the sink or the toilet, wherever it normally goes. We're going to rinse the basin with running water and set it down in the sink. We're going to disinfect per policy. And we'll use a paper towel to pick up the basin. We're going to use a paper towel to dry the inside and a paper towel to dry the outside. And then we'll use a paper towel to collect our supplies and to open the drawer. Okay. Good. So, okay. So the basin is used for one patient only. Right. So let's say they throw up or mm -hmm. they bleed into the basin. Would that, would we have to like, would that get disinfected? And we'll be able to use it, or would we have to throw it away and get a new basin? No, it would be disinfected, okay. or it may just be rinsed. It may just be rinsed. It depends on your care plan for that patient. Okay. But no, we really don't want to throw them away. And let me explain why. How many of you guys have been to a hospital as a patient? Okay. At the end of that visit, you probably got a nice little gift in the mail called a bill. Anybody get a bill? Even if you have insurance, there's a certain portion that you're responsible for. Usually it's about 30%. Um, and then you've got your deductible to consider as well. So the hospital operates kind of like this. Let me give you an example that makes more sense. How many guys go out to eat ever? Anybody ever go out to eat? Okay, when you decide on a restaurant that you want to go out to eat to, you decide in a large part based on your budget. Okay. If I have a McDonald's budget, then I'm probably not going to make a, a reservation at Red Lobster. Okay, I decide based on my budget. So, the hospital operates a little different though. The hospital operates like a restaurant that you go in and you sit down and they don't give you a menu. You have no idea what anything costs and you actually don't even get to choose what you're going to order. You go in, you sit down, they tell you what they're going to serve you and at the end they give you a bill regardless of whether you can pay it. That's how the hospital operates. Now what's on that bill is every single thing that you have used while you stayed there. Everything from a toothbrush all the way to medications, plus a daily room rate as well. 
So every single thing that we get for the patient to use, they're going to get charged for. So if we have a basin that we threw out because the patient threw up in it, and then we go get another basin, that patient is going to be charged for that at about $30 a piece. <clears throat> when it could have simply been cleaned, right? But let's think about things from an environmental standpoint beyond the patient bill. We use a basin and we throw it out because it has vomit in it. We use a bedpan, we don't want to clean it, and we throw that out because it has urine in it. And we use a food tray, we throw that out because we don't want to clean it, right? So all of these things don't just disappear when we throw them out. They end up going to a landfill. And we can't burn them because that they're plastic. And that creates holes in our ozone layer. And that's a really bad thing. So they end up just stockpiling in uh, landfills. And it's unnecessary when these things could just be washed out. Now, I'm in a lot of CNA groups online. This comes up a lot. A lot of CNAs. Somebody posted in one of the groups, what do you guys do with bedpans after the patient uses them? And almost, there were like 500 comments. Almost everyone was, I throw them away. I throw them away. I throw them away. Now, how many times do you guys go to a bathroom a day? <clears throat> and if we're throwing bedpans away for every patient, every time they're going to the bathroom, that's a mind-boggling amount of bedpans when this could simply be washed and reused. So we've got to be a little bit more diligent about what we, um, the, the costs that we're passing on to not just our patients, but also our future generations and having to deal with all of this landfill mess. And if the facility's saving money on bedpans, then you might get a little bit more in paycheck. That's right. That's right. And this goes along with gloves as well. Now, let me tell you a little bit about gloves. I didn't talk to you about this earlier, but let me tell you a little bit about gloves. Wait on time. All right. So every pair of gloves that you wear doesn't just disappear into the atmosphere when you take them off. They got to go somewhere. We can't burn them. So what we used to do up until recently is we put them in great big metal drums, we poke holes in the top of the drums, take them out to the middle of the Pacific Ocean, drop them in, they fill up with water and go to the bottom. Out of sight, out of mind. That happened for years and years and years and years. It was a great way to deal with our medical waste because we didn't have to look at it. Well, now the fish that we're pulling out of the northern Pacific Ocean have high levels of latex in them. Now, for somebody like you that is allergic to latex, you probably don't even think twice about ordering fish no. and, and eating it. And yet that fish may trigger your latex allergy because it has high levels of latex in it. We have poisoned our food supply, people. So now we're back to stockpiling them, landfills. Just throw them in a landfill, throw them in a landfill. Well, that sounds like a good option until you realize that just in America, not talking worldwide, just right here, good old US of A, right? Just in medicine, I'm not talking about dental, vet, housekeeping, culinary, just medicine. We use enough gloves in healthcare in the US to fill a football stadium 35 feet deep every day. every day. Now, it doesn't take long to start adding that up and realizing that that's not sustainable. Uh, I'm probably out of here in about 30 years, not gonna be my problem. It will be my granddaughter's problem. So we gotta get smarter about this, guys. Wearing gloves routinely for no reason other than you don't understand infection control is contributing to a problem that these future generations are going to have to deal with. Same thing with medical supplies. 
And it will get to the point, I can guarantee it, that they're not going, they're going to make medical supplies non-disposable at some point. Because we're not smart in how we use them. Does that make sense? So we've got to be a little bit more judicious in how we do the decisions that we're making for our patients, but also for future generations. Once we're done putting everything away, we can throw those paper towels away. And that's basin cleaning. So you're going to see a lot of basin cleaning and a lot of skills that we're going to go over. Don't worry if you don't get it right now. It's okay. You're going to see this over and over, and it will start to sink in and make sense the more you see it. But I do like to go over the process so you see what I'm doing at the sink in a few minutes. Okay? Good? Good? All right. So we're going to learn mouth care, and this is in activities of daily living. So page 89 goes over ADLs. Remember that mouth care is an ADL. And ADLs really are what CNAs do. We help patients with things they can't do for themselves. So let's get into the actual mouth care. Page 93 has the care plan at the top of the page. This is the testing care plan. So this care plan says a resident with natural teeth is lying in bed and needs mouth care. The resident is not able to provide their own mouth care. So this is easy. Patient needs mouth care, they're laying in bed. That's pretty much all we need to know. We're gonna follow the care plan because skill rules tells us to. We're gonna do the opening because every skill starts with the opening and every opening starts with a knock, right? And we're going to use supplies. We have to have a clean place to put them. So we'll get a barrier. We have to evaluate if we need gloves, which we're touching body fluids, so we do. We're going to be using a towel. So we're not gonna hold that towel up against our uniform. And we're, if we take too many and we don't use them, we know to put them in the hamper. And we're going to clean our basin after we brush the teeth the way I just described. At the end of the skill, we'll do our closing. So we know the principles involved here. So let's go over the skill specific steps that we haven't covered. So these are steps specific to mouth care. First of all, our patient needs to be sitting fully upright and this patient is lying in bed. So that means that we're going to have to put the head of the bed up to do this skill, okay? Remember that lying down is not a safe position and our patient may aspirate or breathe liquid into the lungs. So the problem here is when do we put the head of the bed up, okay? We know the bed controller isn't clean. It's not. Um, and we can't touch the patient until our hands are clean. That's a part of the opening. Remember, I, I stressed that. We can't touch the patient until we have clean hands. So this presents a problem. So what we're going to do is our whole opening, knock, knock, knock. Hi, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. I'm here to brush your teeth. Is that okay? Pull the curtain, wash hands, go get my barrier, go get all of my supplies and put them on the barrier. I haven't put the head of the bed up yet. Now I'm ready to start the skill. So I'm going to go get a paper towel and use that paper towel between my hand and the bed control to put the head of the bed up. That keeps my hands clean for the mouth care, but it gets the patient's head all the way up as well. So we're gonna use that paper towel as a barrier to elevate the head of the bed. Good? Mm -hmm. Now this is a little bit different than what you're going, I'm gonna show you the video for this in just a minute because it's got really good close-ups. This is a little different than what you're gonna see in the video. This is something that has changed recently. So you're gonna follow these steps. I'm getting ready to retake the video, the videos as soon as you guys graduate. <laughs> I'm, I'm coming in here and retaping everything. All these videos that I'm gonna show you, they are taped by me in this room. And uh, I do each one about 
four to six times and stitch that footage together with different camera angles so you can really see good close-ups. So you're going to follow this process even though the video has me putting the head of the bed up during the opening. Okay. So a little change for you. All right, dignity is important. So we're going to put a towel over their chest. We've talked about that. And we do want to wet that toothbrush before we apply toothpaste. This was a question that came up earlier. Remember we talked about hand washing and I said we needed to wet our hands before we put soap on so that the soap spread? This is the same thing. We're going to wet the toothbrush in our cup of water before we put the toothpaste on it so that the toothpaste spreads effectively. We're going to brush the top, the bottom, the front, the back, and the tongue. You don't have to do it in any order. You don't have to do it for any particular time. They're not timing you. It doesn't have to be two minutes. There's no flossing. You're just showing that you can get all of the surfaces. That's all they're looking at here. In fact, this is one checkpoint out of 32. Tongue too. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit on the tip of the tongue. Yeah. Um, helpful tip, the more toothpaste you use, the more they have to rinse, little dab will do you. <laughs> Don't get like a huge, big swipe of toothpaste because you'll be rinsing for days. No one wants to be a drippy, wet mess, so make sure you dry their face off when you're done with this skill. Um, and you want to leave the patient's face and clothing dry. So we're going to let them rinse and spit as much as they want to, as much as they need to, and then we'll leave their uh, face dry. So you dry their face with the towel that's there or with the paper towel? With the towel that's on their chest. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you guys ready to see this skill? Mm -hmm. Step-by-step -step instructions <laughs> are located on page 93. Hello. Hi, Mr. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Good. How are you? Wonderful. I need to do mouth care. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. I'm going to put the head of your bed up. And then I'll close the curtain, wash my hands, and gather my supplies. Okay. We'll get you to a full upright sitting position for safety. And if I can get you to lean forward, please. There you go. Is that more comfortable? Yes, much. Okay, I'm going to close your curtain and wash my hands now. I'll gather my supplies. I'm going to start with a barrier and we'll place that on your overbed table. I'm going to get a towel, a set of gloves, a basin, toothbrush and toothpaste and a cup of water. We'll prepare the toothbrush first. We'll get it wet, place a little bit of toothpaste on it and set it in the basin. Mr. Jones, can I place this towel over your chest? Yes, please. Okay. And now I'll apply my gloves. Okay, Mr. Jones, can you open wide for me? 
I'm going to brush the back on the bottom. The back on the top. And can you bring your teeth together? And stick your tongue out for me. Thank you. Set that aside. Go ahead and take a sip. Rinse your mouth. Let me wipe that off for you. Another sip. No, thank you. Okay. Now I'm going to dispose of my cup, wrapper, and toothbrush. I'll be right back. I'm going to remove the towel and place it into dirty linen. I'm going to go clean the basin and I'll be right back. I'll place the toothpaste in the basin, use the paper towel to open the drawer, and place the basin and toothpaste in the drawer. I'll clean up my work environment and go throw these items away. Now I can remove my gloves. Okay, Mr. Jones, is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? No, A magazine? Baby. No, thank you. Okay, your call light is right here. If you should have any needs, let me know. Can I adjust the head of the bed for you? No, this is great. Okay, I'm going to open the curtain and go wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll think about my skill, make any corrections I need to make, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. All right, any questions on that? I noticed that you used two different fresh beans, or it's just because you were close to one or, or another, or you put the gloves and the the uh, the barrier barrier in a different. It doesn't bean. matter what trash can you use. So you don't separate the, the trash. Right. No, no, you don't have to separate the trash. I think I used the same trash can for all of it, but I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe it was the linen that you put into that. The bowl. linen went into the, the hamper, yeah. the basket. The linen did go in the basket, uh, the towel. Yeah, but the, the tip version, the, the cup, you also, I think you put in another one. And this one, the last one, it was empty. Then I thought you have to put the gloves and the bear in a different. Uh, no, everything goes in a trash can anywhere. Okay. Anywhere. Okay. While we're doing, um, like while we're in the exam, do you think it's better to like be telling the person what you're about to go do? Great question. So I actually have a lesson on this called Do I Need to Talk It Out? And mm -hmm. you'll see that on... Page 137 um, is a lesson on that. Do I need to talk it out? The answer is, okay, you guys are all here to learn how to be a CNA, right? That means that you didn't know how to be a CNA before you enrolled in the class. You had to come to class to learn what to do, how to pass tests, right? Right? Is that fair? Do you know who else doesn't know what you're doing? The patient. The patient. That's right. We can't assume that the patient knows what we're doing and why we're doing it. 
So I want you to imagine for a second being the patient. You are a, you're, you're in a strange place. You're surrounded by strangers. They're going into your drawer where all of your personal items are. They're uh, getting ready to do something to you, but you don't know what. And you don't know what's expected of you. That can be a very um, anxiety-filled process for the patient. So the more information you give them, the more at ease they'll be because they know what's expected of them. Most patients are pretty, they, they want to please. They, they want to do what's expected of them. But if they don't know what that is, that causes a ton of anxiety for them. So the more you tell them, the more compliant and the more comfortable they are. It's also a socialization for them. Sure, absolutely. Home, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So just like I did that in, in the video, I went over all the steps. Yes, I'm training you guys, and that's why I say that loud. But if that were a real scenario and he were a real patient and there were no cameras and it was just him and I, it would sound exactly the same exactly the same because yes i know i'm training you with the video but in reality i'm actually training him as well but would it help us during the test to talk to her? it absolutely does and that's what that lesson in the book talks to you about because remember for the test the evaluators have this checklist in front of them so you're over there doing mouth care, but they have to check items off of here, which means they may not be looking at you the entire time. They see you do something, they come down here to check something off. They may not see something, but if you're saying it out loud, then you get a check mark on it. So it helps you for the test as well. Okay, good. Questions? Am I going too fast for anybody? No. We're covering a lot of ground today. It does get a little bit easier after this because once we get all of these um, principles down, then it's just utilizing the principles and different skills. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a lot of repetition built in. Um, question I get asked a lot is, do I have to brush everybody's teeth? And the answer is no. It depends on the care plan. Some patients will be able to brush their own and we're going to let them. Absolutely. If they can brush their own, it helps with independence. It helps with um, a sense of well-being and, uh, you know, being involved in their own care. Um, but it's also physical activity that people need to be doing for overall wellness. Mm -hmm. So if they can do something, the care plan is not going to tell us to do it. We're going to let them do it. Okay. So the answer to that question. Uh, question is, what does the care plan say? Okay, good. All right, moving on to page 102. This is our last skill for today. We are going to learn how to dress a resident with a weak arm. Now, lots of principles involved in this one. You can see them all listed down here. And man, this looks like a really big skill. But we already know to follow the we know that every skill starts with an opening. Every opening starts with a uh -huh. knock. We're going to evaluate if we need gloves. So is the patient leaking? Are we going to touch personal skin or any non-intact skin? We're going to use a barrier because we need supplies and we need a clean place to put them. We uh, are going to be touching linens. So linen rules apply. We're not going to hold them up next to our uniform. And if we don't use it, we... Yeah. Um, and we're going to do our closing. So even though this looks very complex, you already know 90% of it. But we do have to learn a new principle. We're going to learn how to use a privacy blanket. And then we're going to go over our specific steps as well. Again, I have a video for this. Your cliff notes are down there. If you look down here at the bottom of the page, you'll see that this skill should take somebody with your level of experience 14 minutes or less going to be done on a mannequin because none of you guys want to get undressed <laughs> mm -hmm. so this skill will be a mannequin skill now when we're working with mannequins we still 
still need to treat the mannequin like she's a real person. We're going to talk to her. We're going to tell her everything that we're doing. We're actually going to get an answer from her because the evaluator will give you answers. We're not going to expose her because she's a doll. We're not going to grab her by the hair and lift her up because she's a doll. We're going to treat her like a person. Okay. So new principle of learn here, privacy blanket. And there's only four steps here or five steps. It's pretty simple actually. But our important concept here is that dignity is essential. It doesn't do us any good to help people with physical skills if we forget that they are a human. It's that simple. You are not helping somebody if you are not treating them with humanity. And dignity is part of that. So a lot of CNAs get all mixed up in this. I have heard many CNAs say, well, it doesn't matter. I've seen it all. Well, just because you've seen it all doesn't mean your patient is willing to show it all. Okay. We have to remember that it's not about us. It's about the patient. So we've got to go into this with the right mindset. Okay. Dignity is essential, but so is comfort. Now, again, this is all about the patient. So let me walk you through this real quick. Anybody ever been in a clinical setting like a hospital? What's temperature like in there? Oh, oh sure. Now I'm active. I'm working. I'm fully clothed. I'm running around like a chicken with my head cut off because I got way too much to do and not enough time to do it. What do you think temperature is going to feel like in here to me? Warm. Yeah. Now my patient, not active at all, laying in bed covered by a thin sheet and wearing a hospital gown. What's temperature feel like to them? Oh, we are not seeing eye to eye in this scenario. Now take that sheet off. Oh, they are freezing, but they also are underdressed. They are going to feel vulnerable, vulnerable. Just for illustration, I want you to think tonight when you go to bed, okay, and you jump into your bed, I want you to not cover up with the sheet. I want you to lay there in your bed for a few minutes in whatever it is that you wear to bed. And I want you to think about me walking in that room right then and standing over your bed and how uncomfortable that would make you. That is what we do to our patients every time we take that sheet off of them. So we have to think about this from the patient's point of view. When you are laying down, you are vulnerable. When you are underdressed, you are vulnerable. When you are laying down and underdressed, you feel like you're about to be violated. Does that make sense? So we've got to do whatever we can in our power to help our patients feel a little more secure with this. And that's what the privacy blanket is all about. A lot of people will say, well, I've got the privacy curtain closed, so isn't that enough? No, it's not. That privacy curtain helps protect that patient from being viewed by the outside world. There's still a stranger in that place with them. You. You are a stranger. That's what the privacy blanket is there to do. Okay. So remember that your perception of temperature is different than theirs. And remember that the curtain helps protect them from outsiders, but does nothing to protect them from you. Okay. So we're going to use a privacy blanket anytime our patient is uncovered or undressed. That's our defining principle. It tells us when we're going to use a privacy blanket. Anytime the patient is uncovered or undressed. And this is going to keep the patient warm, but also provide a level of privacy. But we never want our patient uncovered. Like I don't want to pull the sheet down and then put a blanket on top of them because in that in-between time, they feel vulnerable. So when we do this, 
we put the blanket on over the sheet and then pull the sheet down underneath so the patient is always covered. Good. Now, this isn't going to be on any care plan. No care plan is going to tell you, use a privacy blanket. This is something you need to know. This is a principle. Principles are not on the care plans. Principles are things you need to know to do the task on the care plan. Okay? Good? So when you put the sheet or the, the blanket on over the sheet and then pull the sheet down underneath, it makes sure that the patient is always covered with something. And that promotes their uh, dignity. So we already know not to snap or shake that blanket. We've learned that with linen rules. But remember, if something shows up twice, that means it's doubly important. Yeah, doubly important. So we want to make sure that we're not snapping or shaking that blanket um, when we're putting it on or taking it off. And then at the end of the skill, after we've touched the patient, if we've worn gloves, we don't want to touch that blanket with those soiled gloves because if we take the blanket off, we've got to pull the sheet up. And we don't want to touch that sheet that's going to go right up next to their face with soiled gloves. Okay? So when we remove the blanket, we do it at the very, 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 very end of the skill after we've removed our gloves. Where are these blankets together with the... Blankets, blankets are on the, the supply shelf, yes. So they, um, I'm sorry, can that be a clean sheet, a clean... Sure, clean sure, yeah. For the test, we're gonna use an actual privacy blanket, which you're gonna see in the, the um, video in just a minute, but let me show you. So do you need to, every time you use, this blanket, they need to be washed? Yes. This is a privacy blanket. This is what it looks like. Um, they get softer when you wash them over and over and over. So the ones in a clinical setting are a little bit wider than this and a lot softer. <laughs> uh, patients steal these all the time. But it's, it's just a blanket. So we're going to unfold it and put it over our patient to protect their privacy and pull the sheet down underneath. When we're done, we'll pull the sheet over it and then remove the blanket and put it in dirty linen. When you remove anything from the bed, you want to roll it up in a ball so that the trailing edges don't contaminate other surfaces. I don't just want to pour it off like this and now I've got stuff everywhere. Good. So if you go to page 98, we're going to talk about dressing real quick. Oh, I forgot my mic. Okay, so... The gist of this is that patients have the right to wear what they want to wear, just like we do. So we're going to ask our patient, what do you want to wear? If they describe something that does not go together, you can suggest an alternative. Now, the reason for that is that you are judged by the way your patients look. You really are. If I walk down the hallway and I got a whole bunch of patients sitting in wheelchairs lining the hallway and they're in mismatched clothes and their hair is all messed up and none of the buttons are buttoned right. I know I don't have very good CNAs. There's no attention to detail there. But if I walk down the hallway and all of my patients are dressed appropriately and everything matches and their hair is combed nice, now I know I've got good quality CNAs. If I'm a family member looking for a place to put my mother, which facility am I going to pick? Looking. Yeah, the better looking patients. Absolutely. Because that tells me that the caregivers care. Right? It's all in the name. If we're caregivers, that means we have to care. So we're going to ask the patient what they want to wear. But if they describe something, it doesn't go like purple plaid pants and a yellow flowered shirt. 
does not go. We can suggest an alternative. Would you like your white shirt with that, Mary? If she says, no, I want my yellow flowered shirt, no problem. Let me get that for you. So we will suggest an alternative if it doesn't match, but ultimately we're going to honor their wishes because they have the right to wear what they want to wear. So everyone has the right to choose their own clothing. So for the test, we need to ask them, but specifically we need to ask them before we get them undressed. You don't want to get the patient naked and then leave them there while you go find clothes. That's not cool. So we want to ask them at the beginning of the scale, what would you like to wear today? So we're going to use a barrier for this skill because we need a clean place to put our clean supplies. So we're going to do our opening. Knock, knock, knock. Hi, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? I'm here to get you dressed. Is that okay? Close curtain, wash hands, get the barrier. Ms. Jones, what do you want to wear today? And get the outfit that she described and put it on the barrier. Good. Remember that you want to minimize exposure but when you're dressing. So we want to ask first. We're going to pull the privacy curtain, use privacy blanket, and get closed before undressing. These are all checkpoints. Anytime we lift an extremity, you want to lift from below with a flat palm. We're going to go over this a little bit later in the program, but we always lift from below, never from above. When you lift from above, you risk injuring the patient. Now, this is how we're going to remember this particular skill, USA first. This patient has a weak right arm. We're going to see that in the care plan in a minute a weak right arm. That means we have to undress the strong arm first and dress the weak arm first. That allows the used garment to just slide right off that weak arm with no motion necessary. And the new garment just slides on with no motion necessary. So the clothes should be slid up the weak arm carefully. Don't overextend. Don't injure them. That's a big part of this. Your care is judged based on how your patients look. So make sure everything is, you know, done right. All the buttons are lined up right. Um, everything is, they got to look good. Okay. Um, supplies. So we've used a blanket. We've used a gown, you know, taking the gown off of them. Those have to be put away at the end of the skill. This is part of leading a clean environment. So make sure the gown and the blanket are put in dirty linen and your barrier is thrown away at the end of the skill. So call light for this skill is going to be placed in the stronger arm. Why do you, or on the stronger side, why do you think that's important? So they can use it. Yeah, because they have to be able to use it. <clears throat> if they have a weak arm, they may not be able to use uh, the call light. So page 103 gives you the step-by-step -step instructions for this particular skill. So care plan at the top of the page says dress the resident in a long sleeve button or snap front shirt. We're following the care plan. So what are we going to dress them in? Yeah, long sleeve button or snap front shirt. Because we follow the care, care plan. plan. Pants and socks. Resident is lying in bed and has a weak right arm. The resident is not able to help with dressing. And after dressing, leave the resident in bed. So that, that's our care plan. Those are our instructions. And I'm going to show you the video that shows you how to get this done. Mrs. Jones, my name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? 
Good, I'm here to help you get dressed. Is that okay? Okay, I'm going to close your curtain. Let me go wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. The first thing that I'll get is a barrier to put on my table to make sure that my supplies remain clean. Mrs. Jones, what would you like to wear today? Your light pink pants and dark pink shirt? Okay. Is this the outfit that you described? Wonderful. I'll get a privacy blanket as well. Okay, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to spread this privacy blanket out over you. This will keep you warm and help protect your privacy as we do this skill. I'm going to carefully unfold the blanket, being careful not to snap or shake it as I lay it out over you. Once the blanket's in place, I'll pull your sheet down to the end of the bed. Okay, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to place your socks on now. We'll take one of the socks, scrunch it all the way up to the toe seam, put it over the foot, making sure the toe seam is lined up, lift from below and support at the ankle, and smooth the sock over the heel. Now we'll go to the other side. We'll scrunch this sock up, put it over the foot, making sure the toe seam is lined up, lift from below and support at the ankle, and smooth the sock over the heel, minimizing wrinkles. Now we'll help you put your pants on. We're going to make sure the tag is in the back. I'm going to insert one of my arms into the legs of the pants and scrunch it up so I have control over all the material. We'll then place it over your foot, lift from below, and smooth it over your heel. We're going to repeat on this side. I'm going to put my hand inside to scrunch up the leg of the pants, and then place it over your foot, lifting from below and supporting at the heel while we finish putting on your pants. Okay, Mrs. Jones, now I'm going to lift your pants up over your hips. If I can have you raise up your hips as high as you can on the count of three. One, two, three. I'll make sure that your pants are over your hips and then cover you back up. Okay, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to elevate the head of the bed now. Please tell me when you're comfortable. And if I can assist you to lean forward, I'll untie your gown. Thank you. I'm going to tuck a corner of the blanket behind your back as you sit back. And now I'll remove the gown from this side. We're going to undress the strong arm first. Since our care plan indicated your right arm is weak, we'll undress your left arm first. I'm going to the other side of the bed now. Okay, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to undress this arm. Being careful to minimize the movement and support the arm at the elbow as I lift it off the bed. We'll remove the soiled gown. We'll go ahead and rest your arm back on the bed. Okay, now I'm going to assist you with your shirt. I'm going to scrunch up the arm of the sleeve and put my hand through backwards, keeping your arm supported on the bed. I'm going to lift your hand and hold it as if we're shaking hands. This will keep all your fingers together as we place the sleeve over my hand and then over yours. Once we have the sleeve in place on your arm, we'll extend your arm out. I'll support at the elbow as I bring the sleeve the rest of the way along your arm. If I can have you sit forward, Ms. Jones, let me assist you. Thank you. Make sure that you remain covered and smooth the shirt along your back. Come on back, Mrs. Jones. Thank you. Okay, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to assist you in putting your other arm in your sleeve. So I'll scrunch it up, put my hand in through backwards. And Ms. Jones, if I could have you reach your arm up and back for me. I'll assist you to put your arm in the sleeve. Okay, Ms. Jones, we'll rest your arm back on the bed now. 
while I straighten your shirt and make sure that it is snapped appropriately. Okay, let me just adjust your clothing to make sure it's neat. Can I have you lean forward for me, please? Thank you. And I'll make sure that this blanket can be removed. Okay, Ms. Jones, I'm just going to gather up your privacy blanket and place it in soiled linen along with your gown. I'll be right back. Okay, Mrs. Jones, I'm just going to adjust your clothing for neatness and appearance and make sure that it's fastened appropriately and that you look good. Very nice. Okay, you have your call light here if you should need anything. Can I get a magazine for you? Okay, I'm just going to throw your barrier away. and open your privacy curtain. Now we'll go wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll think about the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. All right, any questions on that? All right, CPR flyers are here on the uh, front table. If you want one, has all the um, uh, dates on it. Okay, I want to congratulate. I'm no longer doing my weekly lives on Thursday. I know some of you have noticed. I'll explain why in an upcoming lesson. I don't have time today. But I am doing congratulations on Wednesdays now. So Wednesdays at the end of class, I'll give all the congratulations. So this week, we want to congratulate. You ready? Yep, there we go. Tenzin Shoiki, 1100. User JT7KO8YC3F, <laughs> congratulations to you for passing the state exam. Januel, congratulations, and Courtney Heath, congratulations to all of you for passing the state exam. Way to go. We're super proud. Uh, we have California Girl 0709, Courtney Braden, and Killen is Toady. Uh, that have tests coming up along with Jorge. So good luck to all of you. Great vibes out. We know you'll do great. Let us know how you do so we can congratulate you on an upcoming uh, session. And then we have five that are awaiting results. Kim Maria Hunter, Abigail Brago, Tahayeka, Delane Hall, and Sina. Um, they are awa tested and awaiting results. Let us know so we can congratulate you once you get your results. So great job, everybody. Ooh. Congratulations. And uh, make sure you tune in next week on Wednesday. We'll do congratulations for everybody for this week that let us know that they passed. So congratulations. Does anybody have any questions before we sign off? Nope, you are free to go. I will see you on Monday. Don't forget your homework, chapters two and three. Thank you.